Committee. I'm Councillor Filmer. I'm Chairman of the Committee. Uh, can I wish you all a Happy New Year? Um, just before we start the, the meeting itself, uh, just one moment. We've got a bit of a sound issue in the room, so we'll just deal with that before I carry on. It's your speaker, not your microphone. It's not. It's done. Excellent. Okay. Is that clear? <laughs> Let's just try again. I think. Well, I think we've got rid of the echo now, so we're okay. Yeah. All right. Let's make a start again. Uh, welcome you all to the committee. I'm Councillor Filmer. I'm chairman of the development committee. Uh, can I wish you all a happy new year? Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we uh, make a start on the agenda today. Uh, I've not been advised that there's any planned fire drill here in the canal side, so if the alarms go off, then they are real. The exits are through the doors at the back of the room, uh, and if you can make your way safely out, that would be appreciated. Um, there are toilet facilities located at the back of the, uh, the room if they're required, and if anyone requires uh, a drink during the meeting, there is water to the right-hand side of the room as I'm looking at it. Could I ask if anyone who is present uh, who has a mobile phone either online or, or with us in the room, if you can make sure it's either turned off or turned to silent, just so it doesn't interfere with the, uh, the sound system or interrupt the meeting. Just so again, you're aware of who's in uh, front of you today on, on today's meeting. Uh, to my right in the room are, are officers from our Democratic Services uh, our Committee Manager. To my left are officers from the Planning uh, Development Department, and they will be presenting and uh, giving us the background on all the applications today. Uh, joining us virtually, uh, if I could welcome Paulette Ted, who's from our legal section, who is our legal support for today's meeting. Welcome to the, to the Development Committee. And on the wings of the room that I'm sat in at the moment, to my right and left are the councillors who will be debating and ultimately deciding the applications before us today. Just to, to remind you, today's meeting is being held as a, as a hybrid meeting. Uh, that basically means that the members of the committee who will be making decisions today are all within the room at the canal side, uh, but we're also being joined virtually by officers and members and by members of the public. Uh, so some of our speakers today will be with us in the room, some will be joining us online, uh, and that uh, also we are joined today by the uh, portfolio holder for development, who I think I saw briefly on the screen just a moment ago, so uh, welcome Councillor Slocum. Uh, if I could... Uh, just again, thank you, Jill. Um, just as, as normal, just to let you know, each, each application will be taken in turn today. The officers will out, give the outline and background of the application. We'll then ask the speakers who are registered to come and address the members. Uh, they have three minutes to do so. And once that has happened, you'll either, if you're in the room, you'll see the, the time counting down on the clock. If you're virtually with us or on the phone, we will just interrupt you when there's a minute of that time to go so that you can uh, wind your comments up before you run out of time. I think that concludes uh, all I'm going to say in terms of the opening comments, so we'll move on to the agenda itself. Uh, item one on the agenda is apologies uh, for absence, and Mrs Nicholson, are there any? I'll let you come and use the mic. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. I've received apologies from Councillors Granter and Revens. Thank you very much. All other members are present. No, they're not. There's almost all other members are present in the room. Um, so next item is urgent business. I've not been advised that there's any urgent business that isn't covered by our agenda today. Uh, the th next item is uh, public speaking time. I've outlined to, to members of the public, for those of you who registered, the procedure will follow today. So uh, that's covered. And if we move then on to item four, which is declarations of interest, are there any interests that members have that they wish to declare for today's meeting. Yes, Councillor Scott, um, if, if you just wait for the microphone to get to you and then. And, and just a reminder for all members, if you can wait for the microphone, because although we can hear you in the room, if you haven't got the microphone, all those who are online with us can't. So uh, Councillor Scott. Um, yes, it's just that I'm the ward member at Axe Vale for the um, second item on the agenda. And I'll have to declare an interest with one this afternoon, but Layla has the details. Thank you. Councillor Kingham. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you're coming on now. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm a <coughs> member of the uh, Parrot Drainage Board. 
Okay. So uh, I need to declare a couple of interests as well. Um, one is on page 28 and the other is on page 40, which both fall within the uh, my county council division. Uh, I attend the parish council meetings, but have taken no part in the discussions of, of the applications before us. And again, just as an as a explanation for, for members of the public, the, the drainage board issue is there are a number of members who sit on this committee who are on either the Parrot or the Bruax drainage boards. Um, they're, they are a, a consultee. They often make comments as a, as a drainage board. Um, again, what members will declare is that they've taken no part in, in those comments that have been made by the drainage board. If they have, then they'll obviously let us know and they'll take no part in the discussion on those applications. Councillor Pearce. If we just wait, I, I think again, just a reminder for members, what's happening is when we go to the microphones, it's have, those microphones are having to be just dialed up. So give it a couple of seconds that uh, that will then come in. We okay? So it's okay, thank the you. One at the front. Yeah, thank Pers you. Personal interest as a member of the Parrot Drainage Board, but taken part in no discussions. Okay. Councillor Betty. Uh, personal, personal is a member of the Parrot Drainage Board as well. But okay. No, um, Discussion has been taken. And I think, Mrs. Nicholson, you've got a list of all the drainage board members. So for all drainage board members, we'll now mark that as declared. Okay. Are there any other declarations that members have? Okay. For, for members of the public, again, it's just to make sure that if there's any background that members have on an application that you're made aware of it and the committee are before the, the discussion, uh, where you've heard the de declaration today about the drainage board and also about the applications being within a councillor's ward or division. Uh, we have a, 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 a rule within this, this uh, committee which basically says that you can be involved at the county, sorry, you can be involved at the district level or you can be involved at the town and parish level. You can't do both. The reason is that if potentially you've been involved in a decision made at an earlier stage, there may well be a perception that you've already made up your mind on a particular application and you need to come to it to this meeting with an open mind. So that's where members have made it clear that they've not been involved at that earlier stage so that they can come to this meeting, be involved in the debate and ultimately vote on the applications before us. I think that brings us to the end of the declarations of interest. So we then move on to the applications themselves that we have before us today. Uh, and we'll start with the application on page six, which is in Cheddar. And I believe, Mr. Noon, you're introducing this one for us, please. Thank you. Just present the screen. OK. Thank you very much. Um, this is an application for the approval of the reserve matters in relation to the scale, layout, appearance and landscaping of a scheme for 96 dwellings at Round Oak Farm in Cheddar. Here is the site um, comprising a number of fields to the north of Round Oak Road between Upper New Road to the west and Axbridge Road to the east. I have a couple of updates. Um, you'll note from the report the recommendation is subject to no objection being raised by the ecologists or the drainage advisors. I have not received any objection or detailed comments from our ecology officer. The application was subject at outline to a habitats regulation assessment, which concluded that development could be carried out without compromising the favourable conservation status, status of protected species, subject to very detailed conditions that are to be discharged on the outline application. My view is that the layout and the supporting evidence that is provided with this application is satisfactory, satisfactory demonstrates that those conditions can be complied with. So in absence of an objection from the ecologist, my recommendation remains as, as per the report. The drainage officers have confirmed that whilst they would have preferred at this stage some more detailed information in relation to infiltration and soak away rates with, on the site, they do accept that those details would come as part of the information to discharge 
the drainage conditions of the outline. They have suggested that we beef that up by an additional condition, um, just to make it clear that that information required to discharge those outline conditions should include results of infiltration, testing at specific locations, and it's some very detailed guidance as to what that information should provide. I think that is a reasonable thing to recommend in the circumstances. So that would be an additional condition as suggested by the uh, lead local flood authority. Further updates, I've received um, the police design officer has welcomed um, some changes that have been made within the, the plans um, to provide for better surveillance of the community orchard and that the gates have been added to the rear access ways of certain plots. These were reflecting comments they made on the initial consultations uh, to ensure that things meet the um, standards of the, of the secure by design guidance. A housing officer has come back, um, has confirmed that the this reserve matters application does honour the earlier approved um, details set out in the section 106 attached to the outline permission. He's happy with the uh, quantum of affordable housing. Um, the detail of the mix, tenure and sizes is consistent with the agreed housing, affordable housing schedule. Um, these were considered carefully at outline stage with a housing schedule agreed to complement the affordable housing plans on recently delivered sites. So in, su in summary, he looks forward to seeing this project coming forward and hope to bring families in desperate need, um, bring families to uh, an affordable housing, affordable home in Cheddar, which is desperately needed. Um, in terms of uh, a further updates, Natural England have confirmed their position um, may, uh, and do not wish to provide any further comments uh, on the provisos that this scheme uh, delivers what it was required to do at the uh, outline stage, which, as I say, I, I feel it does. Um, they note that we're not in a phosphate area here where the development would have to deal with increased phosphate runoff. Um, they confirm that you know, the air impact on the area of outstanding natural beauty is a material consideration that is dealt with in the report. Rights of Way Officer has provided, has confirmed that they have no further comments as a result of the, the reconsultations, which were essentially to deal with a number of technical matters that were raised during the initial consultation. In terms of the report, a couple of, um, what well, one specific error in there that I do need just to sort of confirm the, the SIL amount. Um, Unfortunately, the calculation there put the decimal plate, decimal point in one in the wrong place. It's it's out it's out by a factor of ten, so it's one point one million or thereabouts. So move that decimal point from eleven million to one million point something. Um, that unfortunately sneaked through. Um, in terms of the plans list, there is one missing plan that isn't referred to there. Um, I've got a drawing number for that. That would need to be added, and they. Uh, which is for a um, the two bedroom maisonettes in the affordable schedule, uh, but I've got a drawing number that needs to be added in there. And there's a chimney plan in the approved list that's got one digit missing off the end of it. It should be triple uh, one at the end rather than eleven. Um, so those two those amendments to the plans list and the additional condition as requested by the um, lead local flood authority that changes to my recommendation at the end. Sorry, I've just got something. Right. OK, just in slightly uh, more zoomed in here, this is the site location plan um, sort of superimposed on Google Earth. Worth noting at this point, just to point out there, if my cursor appears on the screen, um, the area of hedgerow removal, just this shows it quite well, is the L shape around this little bit here. Over on the up against Upper New Road, where the new access is to be formed, that hedge would be translocated as part of the access works. And then it just shows also the trees that would be retained. There's one down here. This aerial photograph shows two in here. One has since been removed. That was agreed. Um, and then this little area here, this just shows you where the spring rises. 
these trees are retained. The spring rises just about here and runs down through the middle of the site along the backs of the properties in Round Oak Road and then all the way down to uh, up a new road where it disappears into a culvert. So just to sort of fix a few things there. There's a number of irregularities in the application shape, just with her, uh, reflecting third party ownership. So the strip of land up against up a new road that doesn't form part of the application. The house and building groups at uh, Round Oak Farm are not within the application. There's a little tiny barn just down here next to the last property uh, in Round Oak Road. That's not part of the application. Um, and then just moving on to the next slide. Just shows from our records the, the footpath plans. There is one footpath running across the top of the site there. It's actually outside of the application site for the first stretch in here. And then comes through the hedge and along the top of the site, um, just on the eastern part there. Uh, next drawing just shows here is the approved access off of um, up a new road. It's sort of roughly opposite and well slightly to the south. There's a farm entrance on the opposite side of the road where some photographs are taken from later, but just really to fix that. Um, and then the hedge is transplanted behind the uh, the new visibility splays. That is subject to a condition that, uh, you know, to ensure that that transplanting goes well in this my recommendation. And then moving on to the illustrated master plan that forms part of the outline approval. Um, so you have points of access off of up a new road agreed here and then indicated here. Um, is at the top over here is a uh, emer an emergency access. So that would be bollarded for emergency purposes only off of Axbridge Road and then indication of where pedestrian points of access could be elsewhere. Those were indicative at that outline stage and are now sort of firmed up in this application. But the access from up a new road has been agreed. And this is the plan we now are now presented with. So this very um, very closely accords with the master plan we saw on the previous slide. It now gives us the details of where the hedge removal uh, occurs. So I think from the aerial photograph, it's a sort of L shape in here. And then on up a new road, obviously, to form the access and the new visibility displays, that hedge is transplanted back. We also have the trees shown as being retained in the area where the stream rises. We have a community orchard around there. We have a play area for the older children, a leap in this area here. Um, the two trees that we saw on the aerial photograph, there's one left, unfortunately, but that, that, that is retained as part of this. And there's another one down here next to a small leap, lap, sorry. So for a sort of informal area for play for smaller children. We have the emergency access up here and then point pedestrian point of access down here. And then the attenuation ponds, the site sort of the lowest part of the site is down towards the southwest corner. So that all drains this way, um, collected in attenuation ponds and then we'll move on to where the water currently goes into the stream that rises in this little group of trees here. Um, in terms of materials, the layout here is, you know, the details have been amended. What you can see edged in blue and green are, are, are um, reconstituted stone of various finishes. There's a natural light and a darker gray. There's a, the brown, edged in brown. I don't know how, hopefully it's coming over sort of reasonably clearly. Um, there are a few properties in brick. Um, and a, a few in a sort of mix of, of, of render and also with some some with sort of brick with render above. The, the roof finishes are a mix of slate grey or red tile. Um, the detail of all those materials would be agreed by condition, which I'm suggesting. Um, all are two storey. 
with the exception of the garages, which are single storey. Um, this just for your information just shows the in the coloured properties are the up here we have one cluster of affordable units and then down here more spread out another group of affordable units. Now those are acceptable in terms of their size, tenure, position, etc. Uh, to our affordable housing officer. And then some typical street scenes. Um, the top one is along this main the main north south bit road here looking west so we have a variety of sort of materials the you know the dark and the gray uh, the dark and the lighter um reconstituted stone a variety of roof materials mostly slate gray but with some brown and then the a few brick properties the next uh, street elevation down is at the bottom on this on the road run here looking north um, so again you've got a variety of house types and materials there um, and then we have the next one this one here is just looking north on this street here so again you're a sort of variety of sort of, you know it's mostly detached houses but then you've got some groups some little smaller terraces and then there are pairs of semi-detached properties and then lastly this little group of affordable units looking in sort of looking west from this site, this group here that would face out towards the Axbridge Act Road. And then just in a little bit more detail, you can see the emergency access at the top of the site. This sort of takes us sort of anti-clockwise uh, anti around the site, just looking in a little bit closer detail. You can see all houses that have got on-site parking, on-plot parking, which would facilitate the provision of car charging points should future occupiers want them or need them in. Um, and then looking around here, you, see you have fairly substantial gardens. Um, there are you know, uh, large areas of planting all around the site, maintaining the hedge down along Axbridge Road. And then coming down to the bottom corner, you can see here the retained group of buildings here at Round Oak Farm, and then this little outbuilding farm building down here is retained and we have a, la a little leap here with a landscaped area and a retained tree around it and same over here for the the leap and then there's sort of the lap there um, and then just the detail of attenuation pond uh, and you can see here the sort of property sort of set back and offset relative to this property in Round Oak Road this is a bungalow here and you can see they're sort of pushed to one side to maintain a sort of outlook for that property north on its north side. Um, and this is the, the stream just goes off out of the site and runs along the back of these properties here. And then just coming north along up a new road, um, just to look at that entrance in. Again, more attenuation ponds, lots more open space. The little cluster of 15 here, again, up against um, up a new road. You can see the detail of the access there with a new turn right into the site lane within the carriageway. And then just up to the top again, you can see this, this area is outside of the ownership of the applicant. Um, and then the footpath comes through a gate just at the top here and runs through the adjoining field to a point of access into the site and then comes through here and that's where it exits onto Axbridge Road. In terms of the house types, this just sort of gives you a sort of breakdown of, of what we've got in there um, and the sizes and the numbers. An issue has been raised locally about the sizes of the houses that was subject to amendments which went out to reconsultation. The one that we are left with that is undersized is that PA 34 in the top line. And there are six of those and it's 80.5 80 square meters. The rest of these all meet the size standards, um, particularly the affordable housing units. And as I say, those are accepted by our affordable housing officer. But in terms of the size standards, um, this sets out the size of the properties in this column and the National Design Space Standards, which are a guide that we is a material consideration for us. We have not formally adopted these. 
Um, now, the one that is undersized is the PA34. It would, yeah, the national space standards would indicate it should be 84. It's three and a half square meters undersized. There are six of those properties. That is not considered to be such a deficiency that would justify us making an issue of this particular house type. There's a whole variety of them. Uh, all the other houses all meet these sizes. And in this instance, it is not considered that this is a, a, a deficiency that leads us to recommend the refusal. So just quickly to run through the house, the house types here, this is the uh, what the one bedroom maisonettes. Um, so you've got a, uh, it's a one, one, one below, one above. So it's sort of a yeah, little, little block of uh, apartments, as it were. Um, the two bedroom house type for the affordable. Um, so you, essentially it's the same house type, but you get different options on the materials. Uh, again, the affordable three bedroom units, again, is to say you know, the house type is varied by the use of different materials. Uh, moving on to the market housing types, uh, again, it's a, a lot of mostly four bedrooms here, um, varied the appearance through different use of different materials. There is a chimney plan, not all plots have got chimneys, um, but they are scattered throughout the site such that you will get a, a, a roofscape with a bit of variety on it. So there's there's one that does have the chimney on it or has the option to have the chimney on it. So these materials have been varied from the initial proposal, as has the house sites. There were, were a lot of hipped roofs, which I didn't feel were appropriate. That's now all gone. They're all sort of traditional roof forms or predominantly with gable ends. Um, so there's another variation. Um, Again, the materials are varied across the site, and the, you know, this what this house type is more yeah, has the chimney. Uh, this is the PA34. This is the one that is slightly undersized to the tune of three and a half square meters. It's a three bedroom property. Um, to be fair, they could possibly have just relabeled one of the bedrooms as a study, and then technically it would have complied. But they're being honest about it. They're saying this is what this is what this house type can deliver. It's three bedrooms. You could choose what you do with the third smallest bedroom. And then just the final few house types, followed by the garages, which have the option of being uh, yeah, single or double. They have it, so various roof, type, roof, roof types. And then there's the brick variation as well, um, which for an outbuilding, I don't think there's so much of an issue. I think we were anxious to get to move out and move away from the brick for the house types. But for the ancillary outbuildings, I, I don't think it's a real problem. Right, just to sort of, before we go round the um, the photographs of the site, just going to start in the southwest corner, down near the junction of Round Oak Road and Upper New Road, and then go anti-clockwise around the site, to hopefully give you a feel of what we've got. So first one of those there, just on Upper New Road, looking across the site, that's the rear of the properties in Round Oak Road. Mostly there would be open space backing onto them. The ones on the left hand side, so the eastern end of this, those are the ones that would have the house type of you know, the new houses next to them. Um, and really it's only the last one or two that would you know, see have an obvious difference to the rear. Moving into Round Oak Road, just to give you a feel of what we've got in there, there are sort of most bungalows at this western end of Round Oak Road. Looking back across the junction of Round Oak Grove, you can see this all, you know, it's mostly render here. And then just looking at the last few properties, these are the ones that would have the new builders, the new builds closest to them. The two story at this part, as you can see, you've got a variety here of materials and designs. And then just going past that point, looking back, you can see in the bottom picture, the roof of that build, little barn that's not in the site. And then there's a bungalow. That's the one that would have the two houses nearest to it of all the existing properties. And then the top ones just to give you a little bit closer detail of those, those houses. Stood in the site, looking back at that bungalow. So as you can see that that has a number of windows there that would look out onto the gardens of the nearest properties. They would be sort of framed if you look left or right out of the back of that house. Yes, you would see the new houses, but essentially your outlook is across those their gardens looking north. 
Um, just stepping around there is the retained tree that will be next to that little lap, that little local area for play space, and looking across towards in the distance there, those other houses on the other side of Upper New Road. And then just right up to the furthest end of Round Oak, eastern end of Round Oak Road, that is, this is the group of the buildings at Round Oak Farm. Um, that's the current south side. The Google picture here is slightly out of date. There's a fence gone up along that southern boundary in sort of this position here. And then looking from the other side, that's all from within the site, looking in from the north. So it's basically the backs of those barns that look, uh, that look out into the site. Just so that's taken us to this point here, looking at this group of buildings, and I'm just going to run up to the top here. Uh, so there's the junction. There isn't a pavement along Axbridge Road, so there's not been a lot of emphasis in fronting the buildings onto there to create a street scene. Uh, very difficult to provide a pavement within you know, along there, and not a requirement of the outline. So the houses are sort of within the site, and they're more focused in that way. But there would be the opportunity for that. Um, emergency access and the footpath to come out there. Those just to give you sort of view, the, this the building group at Round Oak Farm. They sort of, their entrance is straight out onto Axbridge Road, and they're very much focused that way. And they just to give you an idea of the, the the hedge. That's obviously summer, and I've got a few photos coming of, sort of more winter, winter here. So that's just stood up in the top corner there. You can see. Uh, there's the there's the built the farm buildings, the retained tree that is now a single tree in this area here. You can just beginning to come in on the right. These are the group of trees at that top of the stream. From the time of the outline application from Ben's Gate, um, just looking more or less same view. Those are the group of retained trees. The, this top one has since been lost, unfortunately. Um, but Axbridge Road sort of is sat in this in between behind this edge here. But it gives you a slightly more elevated view and in summer as opposed to my photographs, which are very much winter. And then just coming in along this top northern edge here around the back of this little outbuilding is sort of quite sort of a storage building that goes with the adjoining land. There it is there. Um, that's that little triangle. The footpath runs along this edge and across and out through onto Axbridge Road. Um, looking along that northern boundary, that's essentially the line of the footpath. You can see the properties over there in Ben's Gate and that barn. Swinging the camera around, that's where the stream rises, just here, and then goes down through the site and is made a bit of a feature of us by this application. And there it is, it comes out, there's a sort of head wall and it comes out, there's quite a flow when I was out there at the end of last week, and it opens up into this area of open water. And then it's almost like a water meadow, and then is contained in a channel along the hedge line down to the southwest corner. Um, this is just looking southwest across the site uh, to the backs of the properties in uh, Round Oak Road. Uh, if you're just looking through, this is the um, the field that is retained as a field. There's no development going in this field. Uh, it's, that's that that was that little field there. And then just coming down the west side, it's courtesy of Google Earth. This is where the footpath goes, comes off uh, up a new road, goes in that through that field and out towards Axbridge Road. This is that little paddock in behind the hedge there that isn't part of the application site. And then just all looking uh, roughly from the top of photo, looking roughly from the point of access, looking north. That's dates from the time of the outline, and then sort of looking north. But from a slightly different point on the view on the other side of the road, just to show the site now um, in the in the depths of winter. Uh, looking roughly the same point um, from the outline application and from last week, just to give you a flavour of the site, the, the hedge has obviously been neatly cut back and is currently the field there being used for you know, grazing sheep. And then just looking across the hedge, you can see at this point in time, there were, this is the outline time, uh, you've got two trees there, unfortunately. The, the, this one, the thinner one, has since been removed. And then just, again, just look for some, some views across the site from uh, up a new road, looking northeast, just to give you a flavour of, of, of the site in both summer and winter.
and looking towards the backs of the properties in Round Oak Road. And then finally, just roughly from the point of access looking south, so this hedge gets pulled back into the field um, to create the visibility space. So to sum up, in terms of the principle of development, the site has been allocated in our local plan, outline permission has been granted, which has set a number of matters in stone. The application is subject to very detailed conditions at that point. So this application now comes down to looking at the merits of the reserve matters that are presented you, to you today. In terms of the highways comments, the access is what it was is, is what was approved. Internal layout and parking has been accepted by the highway authority. Um, they, you know, I, I would note on that that the site is overwhelmingly on plot parking, which would facilitate the provision of electric vehicle charging points should future occupiers require those as opposed to sort of parking in courtyards where you, you, know, you would have a difficulty. In terms of the, the reserve matters, the layout very closely accords with the master plan that was accepted and agreed at the outline stage. The scale of the development, 96, is in accordance with the level of development that was indicated at the outline stage. They're all two-storey. Um, so in terms of the quantum and the physical scale, very much in line with the outline and considered appropriate for this location. The appearance has been amended. The house types have been changed to make sure that we are as close as reasonably possible to the national space standards, that the form of the house it houses comply, you know, is, is what we would expect for cheddar. We've got rid of a lot of, well, virtually all the hip roofs, which I felt were, were, were unfortunate. The materials have been amended from what was originally proposed to get rid of most of the brick. We've got a variety now of reconstituted stone, uh, brick, and some render. Those detail of those materials, I'm suggesting we can agree by condition. The landscaping is in, in line with the master plan and has been accepted by the landscape officer. So which brings us back to the final point here in terms of the matters that were conditioned to outline very detailed ecology, ecology drainage, external lighting, et cetera, et cetera, were all, all conditioned to outline and can be dealt with through the discharge of condition. I have not had any evidence put to me that the layout that is proposed today would prejudice the discharge of any of those conditions. Whilst the LLFA have reservations, they are suggesting that a condition could be imposed here um, to clarify the detail that is required to discharge that condition. Our ecologists have not raised an objection to this scheme, um, which is considered to be compliant with the requirements of the HRA, and there's no reason why the outline conditions in regard, with regard to the ecological impact cannot be discharged. And on that basis, my recommendation is to approve the scheme, that, which I consider to be compliant with the allocation and the parameters set as outline, subject to that additional condition requested by the LLFA and the clarification of the drawings. Thank you very much and I apologise for the length of the presentation. Thank you, Mr Noon. Uh, as you'll see, we've got a couple of uh, speakers on, on this application. If I could ask Clive Pancho to come forward to start with. And just to confirm, Mr Pancho, you're speaking on behalf of the Parish Council today. I am indeed. OK, and as, as you know, well, no, you've got the three minutes. Uh, you'll see the time on the clock and start when you're ready to go, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Should a parish council require this application to be rejected and referred back to the applicants, Taylor Wimpy, for major revision in line with the 11 objections submitted to the, this council and also the information supplied by our district ward councillor on the sizes of the properties? The emergency vehicle access onto the B3135 Axbridge Road to the northeast of the site must be gated as a condition on safety grounds. As what has not been mentioned is 44 tonne fully loaded Batscombe quarry lorries use this road as part of their one-way system which is narrow and has a pinch point where it is difficult to pass oncoming, oncoming traffic. Has no pavement so there is therefore it is therefore dangerous to both pedestrians and cyclists and also an emerging traffic form from the development from the development there is no pathway along the boundary as shown in the original drawings for the pedestrians and cyclists so a gated entrance must be conditional 
The new Grange development in Wedmore incorporates bungalows. So why not this development in Cheddar? This would provide the opportunity for elderly residents and also those who wish to downsize the means to do so and stay in Cheddar with friends and relatives. When bungalows come on the market in Cheddar, they are snapped up very quickly. I do not see a section 106 regarding the money round, the magic roundabout and crossways garage, which has been a traffic problem for years and keeps being ignored by this council and also county. There was another major accident there in September and with the increase in traffic due to the mass of development in Cheddar, it's only going to get worse. 62 four bedroom houses that we consider is excessive as there is an abundance of this size of property in Cheddar and there needs to be an up to date housing survey carried out to establish the actual size and types of housing need. Wrong housing mix for this site to just bungalows and more one and two bed properties and some three beds for expanding families. To sum up, the new gate on, on the uh, B3135 in, my, in a council view is essential. It's no good having a, a rising pillar because people can just walk out. And, it's, and as I said before, there's 44 tonne loaded lorries going up there all the time to Hinkley Point. Um, and also we need more bungalows in the village. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. If we can then ask uh, Philip Court to come forward, please. Thank you, Just to remind you, you've got the three minutes. You'll see the time on the clock and start when you're ready, please. Hello, my name is Philip Court. I'm the technical director for Taylor Wimpy Bristol. Having worked closely with officers and responding to various consultee replies, the layout mirrors, the master plan and provides elite ecological benefits agreed at the outline stage. It equally complies with the recommendations of the habitat regulation assessment carried out for the outline. The resultant density for this application is very low, allowing for the retention of the key existing species rich habitats, such as the trees, hedgerows, Hawarai stream, wetland area, improved grassland, allowing the provision of substantial areas of ecological uh, rich open space and landscaping. The retained and enhanced features, such as the proposed community orchard, help to provide a soft edge of village and reflects the existing pattern of development in this area, thus alleviating impact on visual amenity from adjacent areas. Sensitive external lighting will be used to provide for both the needs of future occupiers and the need to protect bats and views from the AONV. All bar six of the 96 homes will meet or surpass the requirements of the National Design Space Standards. The accessible homes will achieve a high energy efficiency and sustainability criteria exceeding part L of building regulations in terms of emissions, energy efficiency and water usage. Moreover, as, uh, as to assist in the translocation um, transition to low carbon transport, the homes will provide external electric connection points to all homes which have curtilage private parking this will allow owners to easily install electric vehicle charging points to suit the vehicle they choose. Taylor Wimpy's construction specification includes a fabric first approach to high levels of insulation in the roofs, floors and external walls of each home. Our glazing specification achieves robust standards of thermal efficiency paired, paired with social transmittance values which aid the benefits of passive solar gain. Our independently assessed construction details achieve impressive overall building insulation values, limiting heat loss from the building. 
The measures are incorporated into the very fabric of the buildings and will therefore persist for the lifetime of the buildings. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at today's meeting and I hope my comments will help with your deliberations. Uh, before I come to, to members, I'm just going to, if I can go back to Mr Noon, there are a couple of issues that were raised by the speakers relating particularly to the emergency access, the section 106 and the housing mix. If you could um, maybe address those points and then we'll come to members for their comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the emergency access, my understanding there um, is that, that you know, as part of the highways agreement, that would be controlled to emergency access. Although if members wanted sort of belt and braces approach, a condition could be added to this permission to require that to be a stopped up at, at, um, acts, uh, emergency access only in accordance with details to be submitted and agreed. Um, so we could address that. My, my understanding is very much that that is, would be controlled through the highways agreement um, in the, that will be running in the background. But that is a condition that you could suggest to be added if you felt you wanted that belt and braces approach. In terms of what's on highways a subject, um, mention was made of the magic roundabout. This site um, is one of three that are making contributions towards works, um, feasibility studies to find a way forward um, with the magic roundabout. At the time of the outline application, that was a desire of the district council to find a way forward on that. It wasn't a requirement of the highway authority that the magic roundabout has to be upgraded to accommodate this development. But they accept that that point is coming. Um, and it, so that we have got a considerable sum coming in from this development and three others in Cheddar to carry out the feasibility work. Um, and there are some drawings at draft stage circulating around um, to find a way forward on that. But that is the only requirement on this development, a, a contribution towards feasibility studies, um, which is not in dispute. In terms of the houses that have been uh, are proposed for the site there is no sort of obligation as it were on the developer to provide bungalows bungalows tend to be more sort of unless there is a specific demand from the affordable housing officers for a bungalow they um very rarely unfortunately on these large developments do we see developers coming forward with bungalows as part of the market scheme the led scheme i think we have no tool to force them to do that um the it comes down to the matters of design and has it does this proposal you know are there any parts of the site that demand single story dwellings on them for design reasons i don't think there is a credible case to say that um so i think in terms of the house types being two story i don't think that in itself is a an issue that we can um demand the developer addresses and changes that in terms of the mix of houses, um, yes, there is an, a, a dominance of four bedroom units. Some of those are smaller than others. Some of them might be three bedrooms plus a study. But in terms of the flexibility of the way they are used, um, that would come with the, you know, the, the, the future occupiers would have the choice to use it as a three bedroom plus a study or four bedroom. Um, the mix, I think, is, is reasonable for the type of site we're dealing with in the location we, we are dealing with here. Uh, the affordable units, that's the bit that we, you know, the, any housing survey might need to address. We don't say to developers of schemes such as this, you need to go out and do a housing market assessment to justify your choice of a market housing. But what we do look at very carefully is the affordable element, and that in terms of its size, tenure, et cetera, et cetera, meets the requirements of Section 106 and the affordable housing officer's expectations. The rest of it, I think, you know, we, we do have to sort of acknowledge that this is a market scheme. Um, the house builder would not be proposing that, that house sites that they didn't think there would be a demand for. And I don't think there's any evidence to show that this is so wrong as to constitute a reason for refusal of planning permission. If we then come to members for comments and questions, I've got Councillor Kingham and then Councillor Bold. So Councillor Kingham. Okay, um, thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 
Uh, admittedly, we've um, approved the outline for this development, so obviously that will mean that it will go ahead. We have a development here which is to the north of Cheddar, which is regarded as a village, which extends the village to the north. It's good to see that the officers have got some say in the design and the type of houses within the site, but I still think it's still very urban rather than rural design. And it's good to see that some, only some houses have got chimneys. Good to see that somebody's put them chimneys back on, even if they're only false chimneys. But I think a little bit more probably could have been done to design to, to blend it in with cheddar, but uh, obviously it's um, what we've got on the table today we've got to look at. So I reserve the to come back later. Good. Pass the microphone down. Oh, you've got the mic. Thank you. Councillor Bolt then. Thank you. Um, it, it, going back to the existing footpath, which is running along the, the top of the uh, development, does that cross the uh, Axbridge Road or does it run along the road? Um, the right of way records that we've got is, is either connecting from Axbridge Road running to the west. So it doesn't, it is staggered, I'm guessing, historically. The route was zig, zig, did zigzag there, but it doesn't come out, doesn't go, it doesn't go straight over Axbridge Road. That's the... So to to actually access it, it at this time, pedestrians are having to use that busy road without the footpath anyway. Yes, yes, they they have to deal with Axbridge Road when they get to the eastern end of it. In my opinion, it's not heavily used at the moment, but I can't say that for you know, the rest of the year. It was electric fenced off. It was the sheep. Would you, um, in amongst all your photos, do you actually have any of the um, visibility from the emergency either way? I don't think exact from that exact point. No, um, I have those general photographs of up and down the road. Um, so it, it, it is fairly sinuous, there's not great forward visibility, which is probably why the Highway Authority, uh, I'm sorry there, so they give the alignment there, Highway Authority you know, clearly don't want an access onto there. Um, it wasn't a requirement outline stage. And certainly I think we can, we can ensure through a planning condition that we've got the details of how it's stopped up rather than leaving it just to the Highway Authority. But I think the, you know, rather than have a, a creating a street scene directly onto that road, which I don't think would be appropriate, lack of footpath, the, the lorries. So we have an, a development that provides internally within the site a layout uh, there. So you've got an in sort of internal site road uh, that runs up through here, which would sort of allow these properties that they'll still sort of face towards Axbridge Road, but they'll be set well back from and there would be sort of the opportunity for north south pedestrian movements within the site. So at, at this time, there's no actual footpath from there up to the existing exit. No. Thank you. OK, so I've got Councillor Scott, Councillor Betty, Councillor Perry and then Councillor Pierce. So we'll start with Councillor Scott. Thank you, um, yeah, I got quite excited when I read this report and saw that there was 11 million still. <laughs> I thought that would solve all our problems. <laughs> anyway, um, no, down to 1 million, but never mind. That's welcome. Um, as previously said, um, this is an out outline has been agreed, so it's just the detail. I, I welcome the layout, actually, because um, the features that have been embraced within the development that's very good um with regard to the size of the houses i think you know a four bedroom house with a tiny little fourth bedroom maybe isn't a four bedroom house but that's to the people who want to buy so i, I agree the market forces dictate um and they seem to be selling very well in our area um, with regard to the gated um, emergency exit, I agree with the Parish Council that that definitely needs tightening up. 
it does need to be um, a gated access because it's a very narrow road and it is used by the quarry lorries. <clears throat> so that needs to be sort of taken into account, please. I noticed that there's two paddocks that are not being built on, the top one and the bottom one. Uh, the bottom one is a very marshy area, and I wouldn't imagine that could be built on anyway. Um, but the top one, it, is that likely to come forward for development in the future? I, I, I'm all, I never say never in planning. However, the HRA does require, um, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly how much, but a good number of hectares to be retained as bats or a bat corridor. So the idea is the bats can continue to sort of fly over the site without sort of being distracted by domestic lighting and what have you. So this is habitat left over for the bats for I think sustenance of the juveniles is the way they phrase it. So I think someone would have a huge task to convince the ecologists that these fields can be developed in the future. Yeah, thank you. That's um, so, um, and there's a, a Dawn just reminds me that the policy allocation does have C1 uh, comprehensive green infrastructure requirement, uh, including replacement habitat. Um, so I think it's tied up as tightly as it can be for ecological ecological reasons. Thank you. Yes, that's what I was hoping. Um, because that top end, there's um, really a, a good show of primroses in the spring, which is well worth going to see. <laughs> thank you. But Betty is next, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was going to ask about the top paddock as well, um, which Councillor Scott beat me to. Um, I'm deeply surprised that we've only got 30% of affordable homes on a site with nearly 100 houses. Um, the other thing is that there was, um, we said earlier about this six houses that are below standard size. Um, it seems odd to me that there's also six houses that are going to be for affordable to be bought. Um, are these the ones that are going to be below the standard? If so, I don't think it's correct for them to be affordable if um, they're not going to be the correct size. Um, no, the, the, the six units are, that are under size are the PA 34s, which are market houses. So all the affordables here and the intermediate ones are the ones that would have the ownership option. They're all two standard, two national space standards. And sorry, just 30% 30, 30 um, that is the re policy requirement. Um, so they, they meet that. Thank you. Um, yes, could you just show me on the map where the actual affordable houses are situated? So, let's go. They are a small cluster up here. It's, it's the ones that are sort of coloured there. And then I suppose we, we have one larger cluster down here, um, although maybe it's possibly sort of more clumps clustered clump of affordable housing down there. Um, yeah, that's bad. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's good to see a good amount of green infrastructure retained for the reasons given. I've just got two questions. On the artist's impression, it showed a tree outside of many of the houses. And I see on the, on the plan, it looks like there's some planting there, but I just wanted to check they were going to be sort of smallish trees rather than shrubs. And also, it was a question about the lighting. Mr. Um, court did mention sensitive external lighting and i was just um checking that it complied with the aonb's officers comments given that it is so close to uh that area thank you um yeah the the only large trees that we've got shown on this plan are the retained ones at the top of the stream 
and down in these areas of open space. All other ones here are shown as new planting as part of the landscape scheme. Those have been chosen to be appropriate in size to their sort of domestic location. Um, obviously, the community orchard will be something more substantial, as will sort of some of this structural landscaping down Axbridge Row. In terms of the lighting, yes, that is a very, I suppose, a very important issue locally. There is a detailed condition on the outline to agree a lighting strategy, uh, not only for visual impact on the uh, AONB, but obviously also to deal with, with the bats. Mm -hmm. That we need to be, pragma you know, I do, we do need to be pragmatic on that in that we will certainly be looking very carefully at the street lighting and the lighting for, for footpaths and whatnot within the site. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that the development of this site will change its character from fields to a new housing development. I'm, I don't think I would be saying here today that we can rigidly control what every single one of the 96 future occupiers does by way of security lighting or fairy lights or whatever it that they choose to put in their garden. I think we have to accept that level of change, but certainly within the public areas, we will look to control very tightly. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Councillor Facey and then Councillor Hendry. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, very good debate, Chairman. Uh, it appears I realise that the uh, parish is not completely happy with it. But I do note that the uh, developer seems to go along as much as he can do uh, to uh, accommodate everybody's different views on it. With all the recommendations uh, and the guidance from the officer, Mr. Moon, uh, I would like to uh, move to Chairman that we grant approval. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Could I just double check? So it was the, the issues that Mr. Noon had raised. Yeah, correct, Chairman. Were you also looking to have the condition that was suggested from Councillor Scott about the putting a condition on relating to the gated? Yes, access? Chairman. Okay. And you're happy that we can work up wording of that to be agreed with Chairman or Vice Chairman? Okay. Yeah, that's fine, Chairman. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor Facey. Councillor Hendry. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Happy New Year to all the councillors. Can you? Thank you, Adrian. For Alistair, can you hold it just a little Sorry. bit nearer? Thank you. you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Let's do it again. Happy New Year to all the councillors. And thank you, Mr. Moon, for everything. It's the first day of a new year, isn't it? It's the first meeting of a new year. You have to be polite to everybody. Okay. I'm happy with the presentation. agree with everything Councillor Facey said, and I'm happy to second them. Thank you. Sorry for taking so long. Oh, Mr. Noon, is it though? Mr. Noon. Could I just come back on one, one little thing? I'm aware um, the members may have had a letter from the Swift Protection League. Um, I just wanted to sort of just, just to acknowledge that. Um, there was a lot of correspondence from the Swift Protection League, and I have added Condition 5 um, specifically to deal with the issues they raised to require Swift bricks, swallow cuts, sparrow terraces, and hedgehog friendly fencing. Just added that in on top of the original requirements. And there was one thing, um, apologies, I should have raised it when I was talking about the uh, new access. Uh, my attention was drawn to Condition 3 that requires the translocated hedge to be maintained in accordance with the agreed, agreed details for five years afterwards. Upon reflection, I think that may be a little short. A translocated, translocation of a hedge is a big operation. I think we should maybe consider making that 10 years rather than five, just to really make sure it does take. If it doesn't take, we will have an opportunity to get something in that would be suitable. There is always a risk of translocating hedges. So, could we change that to 10 in condition three? Yeah, thank you. We're happy with that yeah. update. Yes, Chairman, I already picked that up. Um, on the re, um, number three, completely agree with Mr. Moon, goes for 10 rather than five. And uh, all the dicky birdies, et cetera, et cetera, on number, number five. The notice is missing, another mention of seagulls, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. And Councillor Hendry is second. Are you happy with that too? 
Okay. So, members, you're clear then the recommendation that's been put forward and second is to grant permission with those amended conditions. All those in favour of that, please show. Be unanimous. unanimous. So that is clearly carried uh, and is unanimous. Can Thank you. Yes, Mr. Nelson. I have a message from the legal officer who says lack of seats within the deadlines. My attention was drawn to that, that, that letter. Yeah. Um, it was I believe members, members have members. received that directly, not me. So yeah. Just okay. Thank you very much. That concludes the application on that started on page six. If members could turn to page twenty. Yes. Sorry, Councillor Scott. Okay, do we want to, are members happy if we take a five minute comfort break? Um, we'll restart then at 22. So we'll, we'll pause for five minutes. Right, members, if you could turn then in your papers to page 28 for the next application that we have speakers present. And we're within the uh, parish of Chapel Allerton. And uh, Ms. Chorley, I think you're introducing someone for us, please. This application is for the change of use conversion of an existing building to form a single dwelling house that will include the erection of a rear extension and the temporary siting of a static caravan during the building operations. So as you can see from the slides here, the application site is located to the north of Rectory Hill and northwest of the small village of Chapel Allerton. Slightly closer view here, um, so this is the application site that we are talking about. Um, this is the original building and there is a partially constructed building here, block work, that would be removed as part of the application. Now you've got the location plan here that you can see that has been submitted. Uh, so we have the existing plan um, as it stands at the moment and what's proposed. Uh, the existing block plan, just to show that in slightly closer detail. We do have this is the new access into the site that's already been approved under a previous consent. And this is the original access that, again, under previous consent has been required to be stopped up and no longer used. So here you can see the original building. Sorry. Um, this is the original building here that is sought to be converted. And this is an outline of what you can see as the, in the photographs and the uh, uh, aerial image of the partially constructed block buildings. And this is the proposed block plan. So you've got the original building here uh, to be converted. And then this is the extension in effect that will take the form of a, of a Dutch barn uh, with a glazed link connecting it to the original building. It will sit to the rear of the site, so the access is here. And you've got three parking spaces, two in the in the rear corner and one just along the uh, roadside hedge. Uh, just to look at the roof plan, um, you can see the original tiled roof that's there, and then that would be the, the extension in effect, the Dutch barn building and the glazed link. Uh, two of the first elevations for you, so again showing the original uh, building as it stands at the moment, and the proposed extension, um, the Dutch barn. And these are the other two elevations. So moving on to some site images, this is the building as it stands at the moment that's to be converted. This is the elevation that faces the roadside that you can see here on the left hand side. Um, the building is in relatively good condition. It has um, undergone some works over, over years. It's had various consents. Um, as you can see from the report uh, for equestrian use for the site and the partially uh, built block buildings here would have been additional stable buildings. So just moving around the site, you see some of the other elevations, the two side elevations that you can see there. And the image to the bottom right hand corner just shows you the rear view. Uh, this image in the top is the um, that would need to be removed by hand. There's a condition, ecology condition requiring that. Um, to protect protected species and turning around from that bottom image. This is looking further north. So towards the across the fields um, towards the other other kind of built form that you can see. It's obviously quite quite some distance away. 
So the key issues for the site, uh, the application site is a formal chapel and then dairy. It has had previous consents for a change of use to a question and the erection of further built form for a stable block and a hay store. Paragraph 80 of the National Planning Policy Framework does set out support for the reuse of redundant or disused buildings where it would enhance its immediate setting. Obviously, at the moment, the partially built structure is, is, isn't ideal. Um, we do have our adopted barn conversion guidance um, that's adopted as a supplementary planning document uh, that gives further detail as to when those rural buildings would likely to be accepted for conversion and reuse. Um, the initial part of that is through a screening stage um, that's detailed in the report and then a detailed assessment as to the impact is then carried out. Again, that's all detailed in the report. Primarily, what we're looking at is a building that itself could be suitable for use as a dwelling. Um, it would be a more modest dwelling, clearly, um, probably around two bedrooms if you apply national space standards. The erection of the additional extension will allow for a larger home, a family home. Um, the extension will take the form of a Dutch barn accessed via a glazed link, providing a, a clear distinction between the old and the new. The design proposed has evolved uh, through a pre-application process and the urban designer has been involved throughout. That again is detailed in the supporting documents um, further. Originally, what we looked, what the applicant had looked to do was to reuse the, the footprint that was already permitted, but didn't really give rise to um, a good design solution for the site for residential use. The design that's now put forward is considered to give minimal changes to the original building and the glaze link gives a clear delineation from the old to the new. The layout replicates a tightly knit arrangement of rural buildings that would be likely to be seen in this sort of um, area. Clearly further landscaping would be needed and that would need to be secured by way of condition which is suggested. The site lies within uh, Band C of the North Somerset Amendment Bat Special Area of Conservation. A preliminary roost assessment has been provided to assess for the presence of bats, birds and amphibians and mitigation measures and biodiversity enhancements would need to be secured by way of conditions which are suggested. As mentioned earlier, the access is already approved under the previous application and there are three spaces to be delivered. It's considered that there is adequate space for vehicles to turn and to leave the site in forward gear. Temporary sighting of a caravan is not unusual. Um, it's very common for applicants to want to, to use that and to reside in that during the course of building operations. And it's temporary sighting would be secured by way of condition and a condition would be applied to prevent further sightings of caravans in the future and to restrict permitted development rights. So we can really retain um, the, the kind of character of that building. So subject to condition, my officer recommendation is for approval of the application. Thank you very much. OK, we have a couple of speakers on this application. Uh, the first one of which is Peter Duggan Rees, who I believe is joining us on the phone in just a moment. Mr Duggan Rees, just to remind you, you've got three minutes to address the committee. We will, um, I'll chip in and let you know when there's one minute of that time left to go. So uh, could you just uh, try and speak to us and just make sure that you are connected and the microphones are working for us, please? Right, I'm here. Is that OK? Excellent. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. So start whenever you're ready and I'll I'll give you a notice when you've got one minute left to go. Thank you. OK, well, basically, the, uh, the, the parish council want to reiterate what we put in our um, comments. Uh, the main reason for this is obviously the height of the of the building. Um, also, the question of the wastewater. Um, the roof water has been addressed, but not the wastewater, um, and that's really what we're uh, we're objecting to, or we need to be has looked into. So it's really the um, the, the uh, property dominating the uh, open countryside in which the property sits, um, and would be against the CO2 local plan and national planning framework. Um, so I'm just really reiterating what we put in our comments. Um, that's really all I've got to say. Well, well within time. Um, so we've got the, the second speaker we have, who I believe is present with us, is Kit Whitaker. Again, good morning. You'll see the time on the clock. Start whenever you're ready and uh, you've got three minutes. So. 
Thank you. Um, good morning, Mr Chairman, members of the committee. Our family have lived in both Chapel and Stone Allerton uh, since 2006, and we're here today to represent our application. We would like to address the objections raised by the Parish Council. Unfortunately, we were not given the opportunity to do this prior to today, as we were not informed of their meeting and no minutes were published. The, the Parish Council's objections are, point one, it would dominate the open countryside. The design has evolved, has evolved over a period of 10 months in collaboration with both the case officer and the urban designer. The historical footprint of the redundant rural buildings on the site totaled approximately 256 square metres, including a two-storey Dutch barn adjacent to the existing Dutch barn, whereas our proposal is for a significantly reduced footprint of only 148 metres square. Point two, contrary, contrary to policy CO2. Polio, policy CO2 does provide redevelopment of opportunities of uh, redevelopment opportunities in the countryside for redundant rural buildings. Within our submitted plan statement, it states that the energy conservation measures will exceed present building regulations using air or ground source heat pumps for space and water heating. The orientation of the, the extension will maximise solar gain and with the increased levels of insulation being used throughout, reduce the need for fossil fuels. We can confirm all waste, stone, crushed concrete and inert soil created by building works will be reused where possible within the site and additionally screened soils will be utilised for landscaping. We are committed to enhancing the environment and have already planted 50 plus linear metres of native hedging on the site. And in fact, there is already a landscape and planting plan submitted within this application. There is also a popular shop, pub and smokery 100 metres from the top of the site and has continued to trade five days a week from 10 o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the evening, even during the worst of this pandemic. Point three, static caravan not being necessary. As you are aware, it is quite normal for a static caravan to be used within, um, used to live in on site while construction of a dwelling is being uh, carried out for safety, security and ec economic reasons. Point four, how wastewater is being dealt with. Wastewater drainage is not required to be shown within the plan and application. Perhaps the parish councillor's concerns may relate to the grey water wastewater drainage from the roof areas, which have been addressed within this application already. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, perfectly timed. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Chorley, is there anything you wanted to come back on that had been raised by the, the speakers? Gentlemen, um, I think Mr. Whitaker has addressed the parish council concerns at the moment, but I'll um, try and have a Okay, no problem at all. Councillor Henry, you've indicated first. I won't take too long this <laughs> time. Um, firstly, I don't know why this has actually gone this far to come before us. I know there's a the parish, I get all that, but there's no reason to turn this down whatsoever. This is a really first class application. The applicant has gone to great lengths uh, to satisfy the greens, ecology, one thing, all that kind of stuff. The height of the building, which was a bit of a, a concern for the parish council, I think, is already there in place. So I'm not quite sure how you can have a complaint about that of something that's already there and has been there for some time. Uh, I think the, the application is fine, absolutely good. And uh, I kind of wish it was my house, to be honest, it's that nice. But thank you for the moment. Ms. Chorley, are you just able to confirm what's what's currently there and what's not there yes. at the moment? Yes. So the existing building that's there at the moment is this stone building, which is the lower of the two, and is shown here. Um, the height of that existing stone building is approximately 2.8 um, with uh, to eaves and to ridge 5.25. The eaves height of the proposed extension, which is what you can see here, is 5.45 with an overall ridge height of 6.8. Uh, this building, whilst it may replicate something that was there previously, it isn't there currently. Uh, so what's there currently is this partially built block structure um, and this being the, the, the building that we're looking to retain um, that's the more historical building.
Okay. The other thing is obviously we, we were meant it was mentioned that there was other planning applications that we made on this site. I was just querying whether we had details of what was held currently in terms of permission on that site. I've got Councillor King on next in terms of a speaker, so if you can get the mic ready. Do you want to go ahead with your question and then we'll address both at the same time? Um, I'm, a, I'm in sort of agreement with um, Councillor Hendry, actually. Um, I think they've gone a long way to create a design which fits in with the rural scene. And it's quite interesting that uh, if you travel from Webmore to Cheddar, there's a very similar building being erected there. Um, so we've already set a precedence for this design and uh, and I think that the two the two buildings together, I think they will really enhance that area and I would be quite in favour of uh, proposing the application. Okay. Was it Councillor Facey, were you indicating or were you indicating that it was Councillor Hendry? <laughs> Sorry. We'll go with Councillor Scott and then Councillor Hendry. Oh, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> yeah, so I passed by this um, building um, on my way to the vets, and um, it, yeah, it, it needs some um, sort of something doing to it. And actually, this design does look as though it would encompass a sort of a country sort of look to it. So I welcome that. Um, I think one of the concerns the parish council was raising was about the foul water drainage. Um, but I see in the report that. Um, the application says that it will be dealt with by a way of a package treatment plant. Um, it's just really to confirm that that is the, the case, I think, which probably allay their fears on that. Ms. Shirley. Thank you. Apologies for the delay there. So this was the uh, previous scheme. Um, so you can see the height of that building was 3.31 metres uh, to ridge had quite a low pitch. Um, it was a stable block, so you would expect it to have a, a much lower kind of pitch. But as uh, the applicant pointed out, the overall footprint would have been greater. So um, the footprint is is smaller from what we have now, but that that is. Um, but we do have a, a greater height, um, but obviously located to the rear of the site rather than kind of more predominant in terms of the roadside. Uh, with regards to the last point about foul water drainage, um, yes, it is uh, detailed in the application form that it's a package treatment plant, um, and it's also covered off in there that that is uh, provided for separately under other regulations in a licensing regime. Uh, so further information isn't isn't required as part of the planning application uh, process. Um, assuming that's within the curtilage of the dwelling, it wouldn't in itself require consent. Councillor Henry. Thank you. Um, I stand by what I first said. This applicant has gone to great lengths to have all the boxes ticked, all bases covered, and I'm more than happy to second the recommendation. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. And I'm not seeing any other indications from members. So we've had a recommendation both proposed and seconded to grant permission. All those in favour, please indicate. That would appear to be unanimous. That's clearly carried, so permission is granted. Right, members, the next application we have this morning is on page 40. And we're in East Brent. And I think Mrs. DeVries, you're introducing this one, please.
Right, thank you very much. Um, hopefully everyone can see that. So this application is before members um, as the recommendation is contrary to parish council comments um, who originally raised, raised no objection to the development of the siting for the 10 lodges, um, but following the um, re-advertising of the application to include the reciting of six lodges that have already been granted consent, they have subsequently raised concern regarding um, flood risk, insufficient flood warning system, and the location of the site within the countryside resulting in unsustainable development. So the relevant policies in the report are listed above and the main considerations in this case are principal development, size, scale and design, impact on heritage assets, residential immunity, equalities, highway consideration, impact on ecology and flood risk and drainage. So in respect of principle, the site is located within the countryside, although forms um, an area to the rear of Rookery Manor, which currently has consent and is building out 35 lodges for tourism accommodation. So this application seeks for the reciting um, of six that have previously been approved as they've been cited in differing locations to the consent and 10 additional lodges. So these would be in association with the existing site. And whilst it's in the countryside location, policy C01 does confirm that development will be supported where it accords with other relevant policies for development in the countryside to support rural economy. So policy D17 supports tourism related initiatives, including accommodation. Um, the principle of the expansion of an existing site is therefore considered to be acceptable, subject to detailed consideration. So this plan just sort of indicates the location of the site, but I'm sure members are familiar with it. From previous applications. So this is an aerial view of the site that shows the lodges to the west of the application site being under construction. Um, so in terms of location, so these ones are under construction um, or were at the time of the um, aerial photograph. There were six consented in this location um, which have been cited but in slightly different locations to the consent and the permission they're seeking now is for 10 sort of in this area wrapped around down here. These were the original six um, first consented on the site and members may remember there was an application for a, a pond and recreational area to this corner recently at, at committee. Um, so the site um, subject to this application is between the lodges that are under construction and the motorway and extends to approximately the line crossing the field. So this location here um, and as you'll see, the, the site's been trafficked due to the gen, um, sort of construction of the existing units on site. So this side um, shows the proposed access to the northeast of the main building um, and the footprint of the six on this side has already been consented, although the siting of these um, is proposed to be remedied through this application. So this layout plan uh, shows the six parallel to the M5, which have been recited and the additional 10 lodges forming a continuation and wrapping around the turning head. There are 30 parking spaces in this layout with access to the car parks to the north of the site. Um, the development maintains a minimum wooded buffer of 11.5 metres to the motorway and then levels are shown to be um, increased to allow the finished floor levels of the lodges to be between 6.7 and 7.3 metres. So this is the six as consented, but recited. This is the additional 10 and that's 15 parking spaces and 15 parking spaces. And that's the access that goes off to um, the main parking area in connection with the rookery. So this shows the floor plan and elevations for the lodge called Tuscany, which is two bed, one of which is en suite. There's a separate bathroom. There's an L-shaped lounge diner and separate kitchen, and the unit has full length glazing on three of the four elevations. The footprint of the lodge is six meters by 12.2. And the second lodge type, um, this one's called Lighthouse. This has the same footprint and again proposes two bedrooms, one of which is en suite, separate bathroom, L-shaped lounge and separate kitchen. Um, this unit has a pitched porch over the entrance and a mixture of window sizes and just showing some difference to the first type. So this slide shows a view from within the site um, of the six fully constructed lodges um, and a view to the southeast where you can see the ridge line to the development, which is west of this application. So in the distance, members will also see the landscape screen to the motorway. So this is the six um, in this location. 
that are already constructed. This is a view looking towards the development site. So these are the ones that are under construction and in the background, that's the boundary to the motorway that you can see there. So looking at wider visual impact, um, due to the motorway, the development would not be visible from the east, but Strolands Lane runs to the west of the site, um, although there is an intervening um, agricultural parcel of land. Uh, this is a view of the six units constructed at one of the site entrances, and the application site is indicated by the red arrow, which would be in distance from this view. So this is Strolands Lane, you can just see the edge of it here. That's the six that's previously been constructed. The location of the application site is, is roughly in this location. So further to the southwest, still on Strolands Lane, looking back towards the application. Um, this is looking back towards the site. The nature of the buildings is that they're single storey and given the intervening land and the landscaping um, to soften this view and the fact that the development would be read in conjunction with the existing and consented development, there's no objection raised in terms of size, scale or wider visual impact. Uh, looking at impact on neighbouring properties and heritage assets, the cottage is a grade two listed building um, just in this location here. So in terms of proximity to the application site, it's set over 240 metres from the site. Um, given the location and the intervening tourist development, the additional lodges and the reciting of the six existing lodges are not considered to give rise to any direct impact. So there are additional dwellings um, to the north, which are separated and screened from the site by the car park. So this is the car park area um, here and here. Um, so the recycling of the six is not considered to be having any greater impact than previously consented, and the additional 10 would be at distance, so again would not give rise to any direct impact. The site is authorised as a tourist site for 35 lodges. Um, increasing this from 35 to 45 is not considered to result in any adverse impact to the surrounding neighbours. Under the Equalities Act, the LPA has a um, duty to give due regard to potential impacts on those protected characteristics. Um, there's been no specific reference to this through the public consultation, um, but the development would result in the provision of tourist accommodation, which would be available for use of public who may or may not have identified characteristics. So the development would therefore provide equitable opportunities in this respect. So turning to highway considerations, the proposed development would be accessed from the existing access to the site. Um, this access is considered to be of sufficient width um, and provides appropriate visibility space to ensure highway safety. The additional traffic um, generation rising from 10 lodges is not considered um, to give rise to any highway safety conflicts. National highways um, have confirmed that the development would not result in any adverse impact on the strategic network, although they have requested conditions um, regarding the landscaping and a drainage strategy to ensure that no inappropriate species would be planted uh, near the motorway or impact on the motorway and to safeguard their infrastructure in terms of surface water. Um, they are considered reasonable and have been imposed at the back end of the report. Um, concerns have been raised by third parties that visitors would be reliant on their car for journeys. Um, due to limited public transport, um, officers do concur with this view. Um, since the closure of the main complex, the spa to the rear of the complex remains open currently um, 10 till 5, 6 days a week, which does offer some facilities on site. Um, but officers do concur that the majority of visits undertaken by the tourists would be within the vicinity and likely um, undertaken by car. Concern was also raised regarding conflict between cars and pedestrians, given the absence of pavements. There is good forward visibility up and down Eddingworth Road, and while Strolands is narrower, um, speeds would be lower, and there are grass verges that pedestrians could use in the event of vehicles passing. So given it's an increase of 10 additional lodges from the consented position, um, officers are not raising an objection in terms of um, vehicle and pedestrian conflicts. So in terms of ecology, um, as the site's currently under construction, there is limited ecological value on site at the moment. Um, the woodland buffer between the M5 is to be maintained by this application and condition 11 does require ecological mitigation and an enhancement plan to be submitted and agreed in writing with the LPA. 
In respect to flood risk, um, the site is located in flood zone three, although due to the change in levels on site, the finished floor levels lodges have been confirmed to be above the one in 200 year risk level to ensure no impact on future occupiers. The finished floor level is set by condition um, by the Environment Agency, and whilst the applicant has submitted a flood warning and evacuation plan, this is also controlled by condition, which is supported by the Civil Contingencies Officer. The lodge is also required to be set away from the land drains and surface water drainage strategy is required for the site to ensure no adverse impact as a result of surface water. So subject to these conditions, there are no objections from any of the statutory consultees. So moving on briefly to other matters, there's been a lot of concern raised about the existing use of the holiday accommodation on site and the concerns regarding a potential breach. Um, the six lodges at the entrance of the site, um, which are outside of this application, um, are currently under review for enforcement. Letters have been delivered to the site owners um, for the occupiers and any confirmed breach will be reviewed by enforcement. That action is still currently underway and all consents that have been granted on this site are restricted for tourist accommodation and would be reviewed by enforcement in the event of any conflicts. Um, the information we've gained from that so far is that two and three, cabins two and three are still owned by Rickery Manor and rented out um, for holiday accommodation through Ho Seasons. Um, we've been advised that cabins one and four are subject to negotiations for Rickery Manor to buy these units back, and five and six have been sold to private individuals although six, um, the occupier of six is frequently abroad, but we're still investigating that point. Um, the fact we're investigating that point and there is live enforcement action isn't something that would necessarily restrict granting further consent because it would be subject to the same conditions, which again would be enforceable in the event of any breaches discovered. So in conclusion, um, the principle of development, it's an expansion of an existing tourist site for 10 additional lodges and the reciting of six that have previously been approved. Um, the size, scale and design is considered to be appropriate. The lodges are in a far corner that would not raise any adverse impact in terms of neighbouring amenities or impact on heritage assets. Um, in terms of equalities, the site would be accessible to the public for those with or without protected characteristics. So it's not considered to cause any um, injustice. Um, in terms of highway considerations, it's well served by um, decent vehicle access with good visibility displays. Um, and the scale of generation in isolation is not considered to give rise to a highway safety issue. And whilst due to the absence of pavements, there may be pedestrians on the um, access road because of the clear line of visibility, it's not considered to give rise to a highway safety concern. Um, ecology and flood risk and drainage are controlled by conditions. So subject to all the conditions, um, the application is being recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from members to start with? If not, can I kick off <laughs> just briefly? <laughs> um, just wanted to ask you, you mentioned that uh, when you showed the view from, I think it was Strolands, that landscaping was important from that view. And that obviously that's dealt with by landscaping condition. Just wanted to double check in terms of the landscape and condition six and also uh, the drainage condition nine and condition 11. They're all prior to commencement. Bearing in mind six of these are being relocated because when does commencement actually count? Thank you. Um, I think we are going to have to change the wording of that. Um, we can change it to within three months of the consent because obviously the six is retrospective or we can word it to say prior to commencement of the 10 additional lodges, um, whichever would be preferable for members. OK. Councillor Kingham. OK. Um, two issues really is one, the fact that um, it's in a flood zone three, presumably these units will be raised off the ground. But again, when you have flooding and you've got drainage, the water will find its way up through the drainage system anyway. So our thing can be put in place to stop that happening. And the fact that they were putting alarms in the reception, as it's stated in the um, Paris Council, and the reception is not used anymore. So who picks up the warnings if, if there's flooding? Um, it is located in flood zone three. They are elevating the land levels on site. So the land levels on site will be above um, flood risk and that's controlled by the condition from the Environment Agency. Similarly, there's a condition for surface water runoff. 
So the surface water runoff um, should not increase flood risk elsewhere in accordance with policy G1. So for us to accept and discharge that condition, we would have to be satisfied that the water runoff rate from that site is no greater than greenfield rate for us to discharge that condition. Um, in terms of the flood warning and evacuation plan, currently the spa is manned, so the alarms can go to the reception and spa. Um, I was given assurance by the agent that there are on-site personnel who look after the holiday lodges on-site still. Um, so it can be monitored through site, but we have put on a condition anyway to concrete um, the facts on that and make sure there's appropriate systems yeah. in place. Yeah, just one other thing I forgot to mention. The fact that um, we've given permission for the lake, obviously under flood conditions that will rise a lot with additional raising of the ground around it. So that could maybe cause a problem, especially with the cottage so near. Yeah, I mean, with the surface water drainage details, um, what we will need to see is, is where the surface water runoff is going and that it can be adequately stored in that location without giving rise to flood risk. So if that might result in the remodelling of the um, pond, that may need to come back to us as a separate application. Councillor Scott, so Councillor Glassford. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I believe you had a site visit there a couple of years ago. And the thing that really hit me when we went up the steps from the car park, uh, where the, the original cabins were, the noise of the motorway. It was horrendous. If you were sat, sat outside your cabin, you, you couldn't hear yourself talk to you. But if you're sat next to someone, you couldn't hear it. You couldn't hear what they're saying unless you started shouting. I mean, I know there's talk, talk about bunding, but have they actually done some noise level tests? It's not been raised as an objection from environmental health. And as it's tourist accommodation, it would be relatively short term stays. Um, if it became uh, unsuitable for use by the tourists, then they would struggle to occupy it and they'd get negative reviews. So in terms of mitigation, the landscape bund to the motorway is maintained. So that's 11 and a half metres wide um, of natural landscaping. But if they need further noise measures, such as an attenuation fence or, or anything like that, that would have to come back in through to us for consent. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, where the ground level has been raised, um, is the pond intended to be the sort of um, mitigation to cover? Because it's in flood zone three, you need to have an area when you raise ground, you've actually got to make a place to take that flood water. So was the original pond intended for that? Or is there likely to be any other mitigation? instances and there was something else actually you mentioned that there um there's a period of um there's some enforcement going on at the moment because of um possibly the some cabins have been sold um and doubtful whether they're actually holiday accommodation um how are we going to protect these in the future will there be a condition that it's only occupied for say 11 months of the year or yeah. Thank you. Um, in terms of surface water runoff and the drainage, we don't have that detail with this application, which is why the conditions going on. Um, the way that people deal with surface water drainage can be through tanking underground raised levels, or it can be through sort of channeling all water to an attenuation pond and then ensuring it discharges at a certain rate. Because we don't have the detail, I can't confirm whether it's going to the dog walking area, but the dog walking area drainage pond is at quite a distance from this site. So looking at this plan, so this is the six consented, there's 10 proposed to loop around the bottom here. The dog walking pond is all the way across here. So to get the surface water from there to there would be quite an engineering operation to, to get it to discharge to there. What there is, is there's a land drain going along the motorway down here. So I think it's probably more likely that it would discharge at a controlled rate into the existing land drain. But to do that, they'd need land drainage consent. So that would be subject to approval by the IDB, and they would have to be satisfied that it was discharging at an appropriate rate. But that's supposition because we don't have those details, but that's why we've got the condition to make sure it's appropriate. Thank you. 
Um, the other issue with regards to the condition, the condition that's being proposed is that it's restricted for tourism accommodation. Um, as part of that condition, they are supposed to maintain a register of people's um, with evidence of people's sole or main addresses. So even if they sell it, it has to be used as holiday accommodation, not as their sole means of occupancy. How we check that through enforcement, if it gets raised to us, we do council check, um, council tax checks. So we see where they are registered. So if they've got a different address they're registered at, um, then it's possible it's not their sole or means, um, sole means of accommodation. But that's one of the checks that we go through. There's a number of others that we go through to check occupancy. Um, but as and when they get raised, we review whether they're compliant with the consents or not. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from members? Councillor Glassford. <clears throat> yeah, following the last question there, it sounds a bit like it could, could end up another diamond caravan, uh, sort of a trilogy or whatever you call, we call it. I think it'd be fair to say that's something that we're are endeavouring to make sure this doesn't, which, which is why the enforcement department is moving in it swiftly. So I'm looking then for a recommendation, please. If I'm not getting, I'll I'll make I'll move a recommendation. So I'll move the recommendation that we grant permission as as per outline. But in terms of the condition. What would your advice be, Mr. DeVries, in terms of the, the the commencement conditions? Because obviously we need to make sure those are tight because there is a history here that we need to make sure enforcement conditions are enforceable. I, I would suggest it would be prior to the commencement of the 10 additional units because the six units have um, a number of uh, conditions that are attached to them anyway. So to avoid duplication or confusion, I think it would be prior to the commencement of the 10 because then it reads as pre-commencement for the additional units rather than reciting the six. I'm, I'm happy to move that with that amendment. That's to all of the ones that are pre-commencement conditions will now be replaced with that. Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Bolt. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I, I, I'll second you. I will do that. But this is quite a messy case, this one. It's not straightforward, really. But yes, I, I will second you and go with it. Thank you. Other indications? So if we move to the vote, and that's we've had the recommendation moved with the amended condition, uh, the permission is granted. All those in favour, please show. Okay, and those against, please show. That's one. one. And that's, I think, everyone voted? Yeah, that's all, all voted. So that's permission is, is granted. Um, Members, that brings us to the end of the planning applications we have this morning. We do have a couple of reports to go through. Um, bearing in mind the time, are you happy that we take a, another comfort break? I did notice while we were dealing with that application that the coffee has been refreshed. So uh, if we take a break for 10 minutes for members to have a break and we'll restart again at, uh, what is it, 25 to. Thank you. So I, if we could come back to, uh, to order again and we'll restart. If I can get you to turn to, I think it's page 95 in your papers, and it's agenda item 6.1. And we'll start, sorry, it's 90, yeah, 95. So we'll start with the planning appeals decided. Mrs. DeVries, do you want to uh, take us through these, please? Thank you. Hello, so the first um, appeal on there was a delegated decision. It was an outline application for up to 165 dwellings public open space, structural planting and landscaping, surface water mitigation and attenuation and a vehicle access off of Oak Tree Way, um, which is a cul-de-sac in Cannington. Um, it was a T3A site. It was an outline application with all matters reserved save vehicle access, but it was refused planning permission under delegated powers due to highway safety concerns. Um, it does meet um, and identifies a shortfall for um, additional housing in a tier three settlement, but it does over provide. Um, the policy doesn't set it as a maximum, it sets it as a minimum. So the over provision in itself wasn't a problem, but the resultant highway impact because of the over provision was considered to be a problem. Um, it was a virtual hearing uh, held shortly before Christmas, actually. So um, good 
turnaround in terms of dates, um, it was dismissed um, under appeal because of the impacts on highway safety. Um, the inspector agreed with us in terms of the impacts of that scale of development coming off of a cul-de-sac. There was an emergency access indicated, but we didn't have any details of that as part of the application. Um, there was a 106 or a unilateral undertaking that they were drafting um, parallel to the appeal, but they were recommending that they pay us sums of money for highway improvements. And there was no guarantee in terms of that those sums of money would actually cover the highway improvements or that we'd be able to undertake them. Um, and some of the improvements would have required a traffic regulation order, um, which if we advertise it and people object to it, it doesn't happen. So we did uh, highlight a number of uncertainties in terms of addressing the impacts of the access, uh, which was one of the reasons for refusal. And the inspector did agree with us on all grounds um, that it was unsafe from a highway safety perspective. So conflicts with D13 and D14. And they also agreed with us in terms of the conflict with policy T3A, that whilst it's a minimum um, because of the scale of development, there was a highway safety impact and therefore there was conflict with policy T3 as well. So quite a good decision for us on that one. On that one, Councillor Kingham. Well, we're ready to go. Um, just for clarification, is this the site when you come into Canning John the Roundabout? And it's off, well, if you come in from Bridgewater, it's on your right hand side off the roundabout. Is that the site we're talking? If if you turn off the roundabout, like you're going over the new road, it's between the park and ride site and the main road going into Cannington. So if you'd have gone into oh, the village, yeah. there's a little cul-de-sac that you go off to on the left, and yeah. it would have got access through yeah, that residential yeah. estate. Yeah, I'm aware. Of, I know where it is. Yeah, thank you. So if you want to move on to the next one. One that was at committee, it was an outline application with all masses reserved for 40 dwellings. Um, I won't loiter on this one too long because I've got a PowerPoint presentation on what the committee, what the um, inspector sort of found on this one. So we can cover this one more detail a little bit later, but it was recommended by officers for approval. It was refused by committee. Um, ultimately, the inspector allowed it. Back to that one in just a moment. If you want to move on to the North Newton. Yeah, so there was outline application for a single dwelling. Um, that one again was a delegated uh, planning permission. It was refused permission by officers and dismissed on appeal. Not seeing any questions on that one. So then we move to the uh, I think it's Lovins Farm. Show of quality. This one was also at committee. Um, officers recommending approval. Um, members refused it. It has been dismissed at appeal. So I will cover that one as well in terms of what the inspector said. So do you want to move on to the next? Yeah. So the next report, um, let me just increase the size of this so you can see it. Um, effectively, it's, it's some amendments to the scheme of delegation. Um, I just want to firstly change what the recommendation is. In terms of, so we'll do the 6.2 and 6.3. Oh, sorry. I'm getting too excited. Yeah, right, 6.2 is lawful development certificates. Um, so there has been a lawful development certificate granted um, for the existing use of two small registered care homes for up to six individuals um, living with communal um, communal living facilities. So that was granted planning permission under a lawful development certificate. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any questions on that one. So 6.3. Um, it's a major application that we've finally issued. It's land to the rear of Ivy House, Fryan Street. Um, I think this one was delegated. So it's erection of a part two story, part three story building to form 13 units. Um, it was a resubmission of a previous approval that ran out of time for implementation, um, but we did need to secure. Um, they, they couldn't provide affordable housing, but they did provide viability. So we've um, secured the standard uplift um, clause in the unilateral undertaking. OK, and again, I'm not seeing any questions on that one. So if we move to item seven. <laughs> Now into my really excited report. Um, so this one's just um, a realignment of the scheme of delegation. Um, it's effectively how the committee currently operates, but it just wasn't in black and white in terms of the scheme of delegation. The recommendation says to approve the amendments. Um, it's to support the amendments because it needs to go through formal approval process. So it's to agree the amendments rather than approve per se, um, and to agree the amendments for the scheme of delegation to go on for approval. 
Um, effectively, the, the black and white changes are just that through committee, um, usually, I'm sorry, just trying to find the right page on the report. We, we've got it in the constitution that if you are on the panel, um, on the committee, that your um, planning application automatically goes to committee. Um, we've taken it as a, as a matter of course, that where the application is a, um, a close relative to anyone on the panel, so namely a spouse or sibling, their application also comes through committee. So we have been doing that as a matter of course, but it's not set out in black and white in the scheme of delegation. So it's just proposed to amend that to include that. Um, there's also an amendment proposed um, that where the development is um, put forward by someone who's either involved in the planning process or they're in a position of assistant director or above outside of the planning process, but they're in a position of authority for the council. Um, again, just for transparency, it comes through members. That is generally how we have been practicing, but it's just to get it set out in black and white in the scheme of delegation. Any questions or comments? And, that, and again, as Mr. Bruce said, it's, it's in effect what we're doing is putting what we have been doing in practice now into. It, it was only when, in fact, an issue came up, we then double checked what the, the rules said, and it turned out it wasn't exactly what we'd been doing. We'd been being more cautious, and we're just reflecting that now in in the actual words in the in the policy. There's no comments or questions. Can I have a? proposal that we're happy with the recommendations as outlined. Councillor Grimes and Councillor Facey, are you seconding? If everyone's happy with that, then if you would show please that you're in agreement to the proposals. Recommendation, sorry. That's, unanimous. That's unanimously carried. Thank you ever so much. And back to Mr. Debris on the, is it the PowerPoint bit? Yeah. Okay, off you go. Right, so this is the appeals update. So the first one is Land to the North Law, Bristol Road. Um, so this was the indicative layout. It was an outline application, so the layout doesn't really mean anything, but it was an outline application for up to 40 dwellings um, with access to be approved. Um, members may remember there was a footpath proposed as well. So there was a footpath going through the site, linking across here and going through down the main road. Um, it was almost as reserved apart from access. Um, key considerations presented to members was the principle of development um, for up to 40 houses, residential amenity, um, highway issues, flooding and planning um, obligations. Uh, the application didn't have any objections from any statutory consultees um, and they were satisfied that the impacts could be appropriately dealt with through conditions. Um, there was significant local objection on this one in respect of traffic generation, noise, vibration, highway safety and the provision of a footpath in terms of whether it was possible and whether it was safe. So in terms of the inspector's comments, um, he sort of got the main considerations down to the effect of the proposal, um, the effect of the proposal's construction on the living conditions of the neighbouring occupiers, um, the effect of the proposal's operation on highway safety, whether the proposal was acceptable in terms of flood risk, um, whether it had an adverse impact on European sites, so protected species, um, and whether the proposal made satisfactory provision for infrastructure needed to support the development, aka the pedestrian link. Um, in terms of um, construction, it was noted that the quantum of development wasn't set, aka, you know, they were saying up to 40, it could have been less than that, um, but therefore the soil import and the impact that was set out in the soil reports and the construction um, plans for getting soil to the site was taken as a worst case scenario. So that was the absolute peak of what could have been experienced on site. Um, there was revised information submitted by the applicant during the appeal process because the environment agency lowered their requirement for the finished floor level, which did mean it reduced the scale of soil needing to be imported to the site, which as a result reduced the amount of construction vehicles. Um, the noise assessment submitted with the application did confirm noise levels which were unmitigated of potentially 68 to 70 decibels, which does go above the 65 um, decibels limit, which does say significant adverse effect could occur, um, but being unmitigated, if you put some mitigation into that, that would reduce it. Um, so the inspector considered perimeter hoarding on the southern and western boundaries would be required during the construction period to limit that. 
Um, vibration assessments, because I think if members will remember, there was concern raised about potential impact on a heritage asset, which was a um, sort of statue at the end of the road. Um, vibration assessments were confirmed to be 0.8 millimetres per second at three metres, um, which the inspector concluded was below the threshold that would give rise to complaints. Um, the scale and duration of impact in terms of how long it would take for them to do all this work was considered by the inspector to be fairly modest for 40 dwellings. Um, and the concerns um, raised by the council in terms of the defence of the appeal um, and third parties were all noted, um, but the inspector said there wasn't any evidence um, submitted that would lead him to determine otherwise. So subject to the mitigation um, and given the low levels of vibration, he didn't consider that the impact um, was sufficient. Um, and also they could be addressed by condition. So in terms of traffic generation, then um, the inspector considers the highway to be like a likely trafficked country lane, which had sufficient width for vehicles to pass, which included a large vehicle and a car. Um, HGV trips for land level raising um, was up to 4,000 or 6,000 um, vehicle movement and no objection from county highways meant the inspector concluded that there was no evidence to lead the inspector to a different conclusion. Um, the provision of the pavement was uh, to be controlled by condition and traffic surveys that were undertaken showed that the traffic generation from the site was less than 1%. So there was no evidence that the junctions were at or nearing capacity to cause the inspector any concern. Um, and the footway, providing the footway does reduce the width of the highway at points to four metres. Um, but the inspector concluded given sort of the likely traffic um, nature of the site, traffic calming measures could allow for that to be incorporated safely. Um, it was noted that the site's in flood zone three. Um, the proposal was considered to comply with policy T3A in terms of it was providing affordable housing and therefore it was providing a wider sustainability benefit that allowed it to be released in flood zone three. Um, it's a slightly different conclusion to what um, officers took because officers were saying it's a local need connected with that settlement and therefore it needs to be on the edge of that settlement. Um, the inspectors effectively said as a wider sustainability benefit, it's acceptable in flood zone three. Um, land and level being elevated uh, would ensure that the future residents would be safe from flood risk because that was controlled by condition by the Environment Agency. And surface water drainage um, was proposed at an outflow rate which was 74% betterment over existing greenfield discharge rates. So it would actually be an enhancement in terms of flood risk um, to the surrounding area. Raising the levels would mitigate flood risk and the surface water would mitigate the risk of flooding elsewhere um, and they were controlled by condition. Um, in terms of the appeal, the inspector undertook a HRA or we undertook a HRA screening opinion um, and the inspector concluded that the site was close to a number of um, SACs, um, special areas of control, but given the distance, um, the lack of pathways, so like hedgerow connectivity um, and qualifying features, so things that the protected species would use, um, the inspector didn't think there was any significant effects on the European site or any protected species. Um, the um, applicant originally proposed a unilateral undertaking um, but we did highlight during the appeal process that that wouldn't actually secure the obligations because some of them need enforcing. And if they need enforcing, it needs to be a bilateral agreement. So it needs to be 106. Um, but we did work with the developers to enter into a 106 without prejudice, um, which does secure the public open space, 40% affordable um, housing and a travel plan and highway works to provide the pedestrian link. Um, my one frustration with this um, decision is that it was an outline application so we did try and limit the time limit for applying for approval of reserve matters because as an identified housing need it meets a housing need that's identified today as an outline permission it can take five years for it to come online which means the housing need to be out of date by the time it gets delivered um, we did try and reduce the time limit for um, submission of approval of reserve matters inspector didn't seem to understand why we were doing that so he reimposed the standard time limit on this one so it, it was granted consent, it was um, conditioned, obligations have been secured through 106, but unfortunately the time limit has been extended to the standard time limit for this one. Any questions on that before I go on to the other one? Councillor Henry. Thank you. I voted against this at the time. 
and if it was up before us again today, I'd vote against it. Okay. Absolutely awful. I know it's been passed now, but I can't understand fully. But it's in the wrong place. Councillor Murphy pointed out at the time there was up to 6,000 lorry loads, was it, or something like that, of, of, of um, backing cement. This whole thing is completely wrong. I know it's been decided, fine, you can't do anything about it now, but I'd like it on record that I didn't like this at the time, and if it went before us today, I wouldn't vote for it today either. Thank you. Councillor Grimes. Yeah, like Councillor Hendry, um, I can't say I agree with the inspector's summing up, but it just shows the need for tighter planning reasons when we're when we're looking at these applications. And I think um, the inspector's got it wrong, but that's that's my view and probably a lot of the people that were were on this at the time. But uh, like I say, it just shows that we need tighter planning reasons if we're going to oppose anything. Thank you. Mention, I think, in, in terms of the planning reasons, it's worth noting that the the applicants actually went after us for cost, didn't they? Yeah. So they they tried to say that the council had been unreasonable and and acted unreasonably. They did not get cost. The inspector disagreed with the decision we'd made, but he basically said he could. Un it's more or less I can understand why you got to that decision, but I don't think you're right. Whereas he wasn't saying we were unreasonable or we hadn't given valid reasons. So I think it did show that the committee protected the council in the sense of you did come up with valid reasons. If we hadn't, they did try and get costs and we would have lost that if we hadn't done that as a committee. Mrs. DeVries? I, I think in terms of background, the, the two, I think, take home messages, I guess, is, is that this, this application was an outline application. So whatever it looked like on the layout in terms of the first so that that plan that that plan is just indicative so we couldn't attach any weight to that we couldn't attach any weight to anything about what it looks like the only thing we could do is say this is an edge of settlement site on the edge of the settlement boundary that meets an identified need does it work and and the kit the critical issue i think for members and during the debate was whether it was safe for highways, which was right for us to consider that in detail, because that was the detailed consideration. And then um, the inspector agreed with that as well. And I think the reason we, we didn't get costs is that the inspector did know it, it's a difficult case to make an assessment on, you know, the noise because of the HGVs using that route, the impact on neighbours, that was a detailed consideration for the inspector. During the application, they undertook HRA they also screened it for environmental impact assessment, but ultimately concluded that if if the noise information evidence that as worst case scenario it's this, and actually that impact isn't sufficient enough to refuse it on, you know, the inspector ended up in the position, I think the officers were, that where we'd got to the point where we'd exhausted any of the statutory consultee objections, we had no evidence to show the conflict. And it's 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 a issue with the outline nature of it so it's almost we have to pair back in terms of what we can consider as part of the outline and, and we nearly had it the other day but on a much smaller site for an outline application where members were quite concerned about detail and layout and materials and the scale of the units but that all has to come later and i think it's just making sure that we don't overstep the the outline considerations but I think with this one in particular, it was it was the detailed consideration of the evidence. And for the inspector, it was the absence of evidence going against the information that we had that said it was OK. And I think if, you know, if we do find ourselves in any similar positions again, you know, I, I think the only thing we could have done differently maybe was was get a deferral to get an independent assessment of any particular area that was causing um, concern for members because then at least there would have been some competing evidence either supporting or not the viewpoint of the members. But in terms of the application for costs, the inspector sort of considered the debate of members in terms of it was the noise, it was the vibration, it was whether it was safe from a highway safety perspective. And they, they were all noted to be material and quite technical objections. So it wasn't wrong for you to weigh those up and come to the judgment that you came to. And, you know, he weighed up the same consideration with the same evidence. And actually the evidence changed between what was presented to you guys at committee versus what the inspector ended up concluding on. Um, but I think it's just 
I guess the take home message for me is if it's an outline, make sure we're looking at the outline elements. And if it's a technical evidence issue, we need to make sure we've got the evidence to back up if we're disagreeing with it. Got mm -hmm. Councillor Facey, did you want to come? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hendry and then Councillor Bolt and then Councillor Kingham. All right. I don't want to drag over all calls because we've had this before us already and we're just having a bit of a sum up at the moment. So I'm not going to drag it all. Three of the main points at the time was uh, traffic. Now, I'm not a big one for going on about traffic, really. It's not my thing. But the road that goes past the site onto the main road, the, the, onto the main road, the A38, is blocked off. And that's going to remain blocked off. So the traffic still has to back down into the bottleneck in the village. That's the way that's going to remain that way forever. The, the water runoff, uh, the flooding, I, I think that problem is going to be there forevermore. Because you will have a problem. You're going to raise that one up by three feet, one metre or something, you're going to have a runoff. It's going to happen that way. And one of the other points was for the villagers themselves with these old cottages and all these HGVs trundling by up to 6,000 units. I think it's appalling. And apart from the fact they're going to have affordable housing and new housing, which is really nice, you can't class that as an infill because a lot of villages have, have little developments and they're classed as infill. That's not. It's on the edge. It's upset too many people. There was nobody in favour of it at all. I'm not in favour of it today, but that's too late. It's already gone. But all the reasons why it's been put, it's, it's been granted by Inspectorate, I think you could you could start picking holes in them if you wanted to. But it's too late now and it's gone. But no, if, I, if this was before us today, I'd still vote against it. Thank you. The bolt. Yep. Thank you. Um, again, as a learning curve. Um, I, th I think one of the objections was vibration on the older houses, etc. Once we've put that uh, as one of our reasons for objecting and, and refusing permission, is it up to us lot, the, the council, to turn around and get a report to actually back that up? And if that wasn't done, should it have been done as an independent prior to this going up to the, the inspectorate? In, in terms of the impact, the, the information had come in with the application and the conclusion on the report that had come in with the application said it was OK, which is why environmental health weren't objecting to it in terms of the degree of vibration. Um, if that was a concern in terms of members' concern, what to make a more robust decision, what we could have done is deferred it to allow us to get an independent assessment of that report to see if we agreed with the conclusions, because it, it could be you know, professionals are professionals and they should be making their judgments in accordance with the information they've got. But some some conclusions can be slightly more positive than what they actually are. Whereas if we would have independently assessed it ourselves and come up with our own recommendations, it would have said either, yes, the report's accurate and, and fine and therefore we can't challenge that. Or it would have come up and said, actually, it's raising issues because X, Y, Z, which would have given us a stronger case appeal if we would have then submitted the counter evidence as part of our case, whereas our case was um, they've submitted all the paperwork, we don't agree with it, but we didn't have any evidence to show, you know, where the discrepancy was or where, where the impact is. But that work costs money. And then, you know, also we were defending a costs claim as well, which we didn't get. But, you know, I think the inspector accepts that, you know, it's not always reasonable to expect the council to um, garnish additional financial reports that will, will cost the authority money. But we could have done, you know, if we wanted to future proof future decisions. It's, it, sorry. In, a, in, a, in effect, what we have got to take into consideration is that the report that's given to us is honest and accurate. The risk, and, and I'll just say this, because if we do defer something to get an additional report, and the additional report agrees with the findings of the applicant, we would then really be unreasonable if we refused it on that basis, because we would have paid for our own independent report, which would have come to potentially the same conclusion. If we then said, no, we still don't like it, there's still a vibration impact, 
that would definitely be unreasonable. As it was, we had a report saying it was acceptable. We debated it in, in the wide, and actually the scale of impact reduced between the point that we refused it and the inspector allowed it. So I think that is that is a key consideration. Um, but ultimately, the inspector agreed with findings of the reports he was submitted. Um, we could have done our own reports, but the risk is that if we'd have done that and if they would have agreed with the applicant, we, we could have been seen as being unreasonable. Councillor Perry, so Councillor King on first. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, we could have this sort of um, arising quite a few more times because obviously Lord Sedgemore is in flood zone three. Developers are trying to get over problems to enable them to develop land, which is in Sedgemore. And like this particular site, raising the level by three metres, you can have houses sticking right out of the ground. Acceptable. People don't want it. Even the people that are going to live there are going to have a problem in the future. Obviously, we had a site at Walrow where they agreed to raise the level of the ground, went to a pill, and they gained on the pill. So, surely we need to tighten our belt somewhere so we can put a stronger case against these developers, stop them building on zone three and places where we don't want them to build. We've got strike, um, quite a strong case in terms of flood zone 3B. If, if it's functional floodplain, we defend those quite harshly. If it's 3A, there's a lot of our district that's in flood zone 3A. Um, in terms of policy D1, it does say, you know, you have to pass um, the sequential test first and then the exceptions test. In terms of the sequential test, the first point is, it, is it in the settlement boundary? If the answer is yes, then it's past the sequential bit and they just need to demonstrate how technically that development is safe from flood risk and how that development doesn't increase flood risk elsewhere, which as long as it meets those, then it then passes the exception test as well. So we haven't got any course to refuse stuff in principle just because it's 3A if they demonstrate they could meet those. On the edge of settlement boundaries, um, there can be more resistance to 3A. But policy T3A does allow release of edge of settlement sites specifically for the affordable housing. And in the MPPF, there's also um, a release mechanism for um, flood zone if it meets a wider sustainability benefit, which is where the inspector found in terms of because it was provision of 40 percent affordable housing, it was a wider sustainability benefit that outweighed the flood risk and the flood risk element could be controlled by condition. I've got councillors Betty, then councillor Perry, then councillor Murphy. So we'll start with councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I went on the committee back when this was brought to everyone. Um, but we have a same issue with um, land raising in my ward, um, with lorries going down a tight road and um, basically breaking up a um, cottage as well. So I just want to know if there's anything that we can do that mitigates how many lorries and the dirt so we know how much this land raising is done and that we can put a stop to it once it's actually reached because at the moment where we're to the what was agreed there's still more and more being dumped on this ground out in my ward yeah so if it forms part of the application um site to increase the land levels what usually happens is we request details of that so we know what we're looking at before we grant it and then we try and control it with a construction management plan so that would set out the hours of operation so what time in the morning they can start what time in the evening they have to finish what days they can't operate like sundays by cozy mondays um, and if it's only a half day on saturday so that reduces the days or duration of impact um, but with this one, you know, it was considered that the um, scale of time it would take to increase the land levels was between six and nine months. So it's six and nine months of how many HGVs trundling up and down to get the land levels up to the point they needed, which from the inspector's perspective was a relatively short term impact based on the benefits of the scheme in terms of it provided 40 houses and 40 percent affordable. So with with the impacts, we need to know what the impacts are. We can control them to a degree through a construction management plan, but if you need to increase the ground levels by a certain amount, that will result in a certain amount of import. But again, you know, the scale of import we were looking at was higher when we refused the application at committee 
um, than what the inspector concluded, but the inspector set it out as, as an absolutely worst case scenario, up to nine months, up to 6,000 vehicles, you know, but in the long term scale of things, a nine month impact to create the benefits of the housing, the affordable housing, the benefits outweighed the impact and the, the noise impact, which was the higher concern for the inspector, could be mitigated by condition with the um, sort of fencing along the edges, which was controlled by condition. In the case of where a, a permission has been granted and it's thought by locals that maybe more is being brought in than should have been, one would imagine we would have a profile of what should be the land levels. Yeah. And if they go above that, that would then be a referral to enforcement to go out and have a look at whether they've breached the condition. The construction in accordance with the approved plans. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank, thank you. Um, the adopted local plan, um, are you saying that um, you would prepare to have a, an independent assessment report for um, the rate of um, development and the traffic that will development traffic that would cause harm to the existing properties quite close to where these um, proposed sites are going to be is that something that you that Sedgemore would be doing an independent assessment getting an independent advisor for that not so much review the policy because the policy the, the policy for this application said um, basically there's an affordable housing requirement for this tier which can go on an edge of settlement location. So it, it in principle sorts, um, supports development on the edge. What could have happened is obviously the applicant submitted um, traffic generation information in terms of what scale of traffic you'd get through the construction and also through occupation of the future development when it comes online. And then what degree of impact that would have on the junctions, because I think that was particular concern for members. Um, and what degree of impact that scale of generation would have on the neighbours, given some of the properties were right onto the highway. Um, if we were concerned about traffic generation, traffic impacts, we could have done an independent assessment of their um, things. So we do occasionally pay Hydrock to review the information and they would have given us an independent assessment, which is slightly different from county highways. So we used to do it when we weren't getting responses from county highways. But we can also do it to try and give us comfort in validating whatever response we get back. Um, sometimes we get conflicting responses back and it's us, us as local authority to make that balance. But if we would have had um, sort of a review of the highway information, we could then make an opinion based on the applicant's information says this, our independent review of the same information either comes to the same conclusions or different conclusions. And if it came to different conclusions, that would be grounds for us to object to something on. Right, because um, there's a lot of land going up um, for on the local plan that's been allocated for that. Um, and it's right on the edge of Bridgewater. So, uh, so it's such more saying that you probably, if there was enough opposition, you would put in an independent Hydrox report for the um, impact on that development going ahead? At point of adoption, the local plan, the allocations would have been subject to assessment. It's a high end assessment, which is why a lot of the allocations in the local plan say up to or approximately this number of dwellings, because it's caveated that we think based on the high end assessment of it, it could accept that amount of additional generation or additional growth, but it's subject to all the detailed reports. So if the detailed report says, oh, you know, the policy says up to 400, actually all the junctions are at capacity at 350, unless we do this amount of enabling work. So that's all part of the detailed consideration of those applications. If if it was a member's concern that, that there were issues with the traffic um, generation or capacity of the surrounding junctions, if we had a report submitted with the application saying there isn't, and county highways are saying, there isn't. If we wanted to refuse it on that basis, I think I'd strongly recommend we would defer the application to get independent advice to support if it comes to a different conclusion. And obviously, if it, if it doesn't come to a different conclusion, my my wish then for, for members would be to take into consideration the evidence that we've got and, and don't ignore it. Because if we, that that's the biggest risk, is if you went out to get independent review 
and the independent review supported the fact it was acceptable, we would then really be unreasonable if we refused it on that basis. We've got Councillor Murphy and then we'll move on to Love and Farm. Yeah. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I appreciate all the comments that have been made and I won't keep you long. Um, I remember, I remember, thank you to Councillor Councillor opposite for reminding me of, that I had spoken quite quite strongly about this this application. Um, the big issue, of course, was in referring to what Don has just said: the impact on people around. If we had more evidence of the impact, I do recall that there's a house you can see it on the plan. Uh, it's an old rectory type house next door, and this lady called me and she thanked me profusely why, why she called me or why she found my name i don't know but she called me and thanked me profusely because she was deeply deeply concerned the house is so old she said that when they start piling i don't know if we'll survive we will have damage and i'm really upset in myself for not having helped by maybe exploring this before and perhaps don you could give us some little last comment because there's nothing we can do about it. It's done, it's done and dusted, and uh, that we have to accept it. But nevertheless, piling, pile driving, three meters of earth, putting it on top to pile drive it, and there are existing houses right next door. I mean, right there, you can see it on the plan. And I'm not sure how, what I'm gonna do, whether I, I know if I'm even allowed to phone this person up and say, I'm terribly sorry, we, it, wasn't, it was out of our hands. But in future, can you give us some guidance about what you really mean about getting evidence of applications that will truly surface from pile driving. Is this something I can ask you? In terms of, um, sorry, just going back to that one. So the application was submitted with a vibration assessment. So that will look at what the vibration impacts are through the construction of development. And in terms of the levels, the level of vibration that would be experienced, that was specified as 0.8 millimeters per second at three meters. So in terms of degree of impact, that, that scale of impact was not considered by the inspector to be enough to, to cause any concerns. If there were any minor damage between sort of construction and neighbouring properties, that's a civil issue between the developer and the neighbour. But to the extent that out here, it wouldn't be expected at that degree of, of scale in terms of vibration impacts, that would cause um, structural issues for the neighbouring property at that value but you know if there were concerns about that again that's something we could have deferred the application for saying there's a vibration assessment stating this you know do we agree that that's the right figure do we agree that actually that wouldn't cause an impact um and if not you know would it be subject to conditions because you can you can put in screw piles rather than driven piles which is a screw that screws piles in slowly so it causes less of an impact on neighbors I can't remember without going through the detail of it whether it is specified to be screw piles or, or driven piles, mm. but that would have been secured um, through the inspector's decision. The, um, I understand there's going to be something like 250 piles to, uh, to try and establish this or flatten this area in order that they can build. But thank you very much. I, I accept your explanation and perhaps it will give us some comfort. Thank you. Levin's farm. Like this one a bit more because this is the one we were recommending for approval and you guys refused <laughs> it was dismissed by the planning inspector so um the application was for erection of six dwellings which included two affordable um main impacts uh, by officers were considered to be the effect on the character and appearance of the surrounding area um effect on the living conditions of future residents effect on ecological value of the site and whether the site would be suitably located and whether the affordable housing was considered to be well integrated into the site or not. So in terms of the inspector, um, he reviewed the layout and considered that extending beyond the existing dwelling would be appropriate with the existing pattern of development. Although he noted that plot one in particular, I'll just go back to the first slide so you can see plot one. So plot one effectively, um, is this one. So the front elevation of plot one actually faces into the site and plot one's back garden was here, which was the access arrangement. So there was issues in terms of the height of that boundary in terms of maintaining visibility displays for this access and bin collection point at the entrance here. So plot one faces into the site 
and the affordable plots were those ones, so it was two and three, which had plot two in particular had quite a modest garden area, and that was the only semi-detached plots on site. The rest were detached units. Um, so going back to the inspector's conclusion, so he did note with respect to plot one, um, it would be uh, sited between the existing building and the neighbouring dwelling to the south. Um, however, unlike the existing dwellings um, on the main road, which present themselves to the road uh, with their front elevations and areas of um, front garden and parking, plot one would face into the site. So given this, its siting was considered to be out of keeping and would be harmful to the character and appearance of the surrounding area. So the rear garden of plot one uh, was noted to be highly visible in the road and domestic paraphernalia, such as um, slides, bounce castles, sheds, anything like that, um, could be harmful to the appearance of the street scene. Um, it was sort of debated that a taller boundary could be erected to allow some privacy for this particular um, occupier. However, that in itself would also be visually harmful. Um, because it would follow the very narrow form of the proposed area and would be at odds from the generally open appearance um, of the front of the adjacent plots. Um, so due to the layout and position of plot one in particular, stepped back from the adjoining property and the location of plot two as well, relative to the boundary, um, the size and scale of the development was considered to appear over dominant and impacting on the neighbour, um, which was the farthings. So just going back to that at the moment, I don't know if members will remember when we went out on site. So it's this property um, that the inspectors raised concern about because of the position of this plot stepped further back. That was two storey in height. So that was considered to appear over dominant in that location. And then the proximity of this one as well to the boundary. So the provision of those two units was considered to be harmful on the amenities of this unit. Um, there was quite a lot of concern raised during the committee meeting from this unit up here in terms of plot six in the garage, um, the inspector didn't consider there was any undue impact on that property. Um, so in terms of ecology, um, there was some debate in terms of the traditional orchard, which came up late in the committee meeting. Um, there are some apple trees on site. The applicant said these were relatively new additions, um, but the inspector did consider that some of the trees on site were sizable. Um, the proposal was that the trees that would be impacted by the development would be translocated, um, but because of the size of them, the inspector considered it would be difficult to achieve this successfully. Um, and that there was also due to be um, proposed native hedging put in place as a sort of enhancement, but the inspector did not consider that, that was sufficient to mitigate the impact of um, potential loss of those orchard trees. In terms of um, the tier four and the level need, um, I think if members will recall, there was a bit of a divide through the site as to where the settlement boundary was. So a bit of a, num um, bit of a concern about whether the numbers were policy compliant or not in terms of the policy. Um, the inspector was generally satisfied uh, that the area of development was considered to be appropriately scaled and well related to the settlement boundary. Um, generally satisfied with the scale and layout relative to the scale of the existing settlement although um, that didn't overweigh his concern um, regarding the scale and layout of the development posed in particular due to plot one and two. Um, in terms of the affordable housing, uh, the inspector did go through looking at the marked difference of appearance because the detached units uh, predominantly had chimneys, uh, so there were some differences in appearance um, and they were the only semi-detached dwellings on site and number two had a smaller garden area. Um, but um, he did conclude that the smaller scale of accommodation and the smallest nature of the garden area was appropriate given the smaller scale um, units because they were two bed, whereas the rest of it was sort of um, three or four plus beds. Um, but, you know, notwithstanding the benefits of the site providing affordable housing, the inspector didn't conclude that outweighed his concerns in terms of impact on the orchards and overdevelopment of the site due to plot one and two and potential impact on the neighbour. Any comments or questions from members? Sorry, Councillor Kingham. Oh. We've even got the inspectors on that side there. Absolutely. <laughs> but I don't think it would have gotten an approval. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? But I think again, it just shows that we can, where where committee feel it's appropriate to go against recommendations, we can as long as we've got the valid reasons to do it. 
and those can be defended. And, and our officers, again, did a good job on this because you were defending a decision that ultimately wasn't the officers, but we proved it can, can work. So hopefully it shows the system works when it can do. Councillor Scott. Um, right, yeah. No, I think that was a good decision because we all felt it was well overdeveloped and I think the street scene would have been, um, you know, compromised. And as um, Alan would have said, a bit of common sense <laughs> prevail. Oh, yeah, either. So. <laughs> Further comments from members. Thank you very much for that. I think it's useful to sometimes pick up on these things, see where, where things have, have gone well and, and maybe haven't. So thank you all very much. We're going to take a break at that point because we've reached the end of the morning's business. Uh, we will restart again at two o'clock. Is it Nicholson? Yeah, two o'clock. So thank you all very much. aerial image just showing its kind of wider um, location so it's northwest of the the village of Moreland and it's this area here that we're looking at here you can see that in more detail so it's this parcel of land uh, that runs between a uh, gypsy and traveler site here uh, to the west and some agricultural buildings here to the east and we've got this area here which is where the built form is proposed uh, the arena and the access from the highway and this is the balance of land that would have the mixed use of agriculture and equestrian. It's currently, as you can see, all in agricultural use at the moment. This is the location plan submitted uh, by the agents outlining the area in red. And the block plan showing in detail where the built form would be. <coughs> so we have the arena here, which would measure uh, 40 by 20 metres and have a sand and rubber finish, the fodder store, and then the stable block further into the site. And here we have the elevation drawings of the fodder store, um, which is the smaller of the two buildings that are proposed. You can see that is open entirely to the south elevation and enclosed in timber panelling uh, to the east, west and north elevation with a corrugated sheet roof. Stable block here is the larger of the buildings. Uh, this is to again have a timber uh, clad finish to the elevation to the corrugated sheet roof. And there are a number of openings as you would expect um, from the stable block. And this is just a floor plan of that to show the eight loose boxes, tack room, wash bay, a rug room and a feed room that would be provided with the access points on either side of that building. A cross section of the site as it is at the moment, so it currently slopes away from the highway, as you will see in a moment from some site photos. And here you will see this, this is the uh, fodder store that is proposed, uh, the stable block and uh, the arena there. So moving on to the site photos, the first image here is taken from just inside of the access point looking up into the site and from the same point just looking west towards those agricultural, east sorry, towards those agricultural buildings that already exist. And looking west now, this is where the built form is proposed. And this image at the bottom is just taken further up into the field looking back towards the highway, um, obviously over to where, where that built form would be. These two images just show the highway, so the access in and out of the site. And these, these images are taken further into the site, so above where any of the development works would take place, but the, obviously the land, as you can see, has started to be partitioned off for the equestrian use to take place. So the key issues, uh, the proposal is for a mixed use of the site from agricultural to equestrian and agricultural <coughs> use. Uh, that's considered to be a sustainable countryside activity. The stable block and fodder store that are proposed are considered to be of a size, scale and design that would ensure there is no unacceptable visual impact. The riding arena, as I mentioned, is to be finished in a mix of sand and rubber, and that is in itself obviously a ground level feature. Overall, the typical appearance is what you would normally find associated with such use. Highways have confirmed that they have no objection subject to conditions which are recommended. Uh, adequate visibility can be delivered and a condition would be applied to secure that. A condition would also be applied to ensure that sufficient provision is made for surface water disposal to prevent its discharge onto the highway that is considered necessary given the sloping nature of the site. A condition would be applied to ensure that a survey for badger sets is to be carried out uh, to ensure biodiversity enhancements are secured and to prevent any external lighting without the prior written authority of the local planning authority. 
Subject to these conditions, the proposal is considered to comply with policy and is recommended for approval. The Parish Council have objected on the basis that there is a loss of agricultural land, flood risk to neighbouring properties. Uh, the application site is in flood zone one. There's a mention there are, are provision in place there to prevent surface water discharge to the highway. They have raised concerns about increased traffic movements. It would be to provide for both the personal needs of the applicant and to deliver a livery function. So there is a commercial aspect as well to the proposal. Uh, highways have obviously been consulted and confirmed they have no objections. They've raised concern about foul water provision. Um, there is no requirement for foul water provision on the site. There's no toilets or anything um, proposed. Uh, waste management in relation to the equestrian use. Um, a scheme has been submitted that can be secured by way of condition. They also ask that there be no sleeping on site. There's nothing within the application that would enable sleeping on site that would give that consent. Um, and there's no requirement for a condition to, it wouldn't be appropriate to put a condition on to prevent that. Uh, so, as I said, um, my recommendation is for approval of the application as submitted subject to conditions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, members, you'll see that we have a speaker on this uh, application uh, who is going to be joining us through the, the Teams uh, system. Uh, Rowena McCorkendale, if you'd like to uh, turn on your microphone, uh, if it isn't already, and just confirm that it's working for us so we can hear you. Uh, I think it is turned on. Yep, that's great. We can we can certainly hear you at this end. Again, just to remind you, you've got the three minutes. I will just chip in to let you know when there's one minute of that time left to go. So start whenever you're ready, please. Lovely, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Rowena McCorkdale. I'm the applicant in this case. Um, where do I start? Um, I fell in love with animals, particularly horses at a very young age. And it's always been my ambition to have my own land and to be able to combine work with my passion. I started my career with horses and studied as a mature student, obtaining an HND in equine studies and a BHS teaching qualification. I've been looking for the perfect piece of land for some time and was lucky enough to find 21 acres of stubble and weeds in Moorlinch, which I purchased in October 2020. Once I'd secured the land, I set about tidying it up, reseeding it, draining, fencing, hedge cutting, etc., with the help of local contractors. I also sold my home in street and bought a property in the village to, to be close by. My 21-year-old daughter, Molly, who was brought up on horses, shares the same ambition. So we are a ready-made team of experience and full hardiness. And if all goes to plan, we should be able to provide an apprentice opportunity. This has come at an opportune time for me to realize my lifelong dream, as I don't plan to hang up my riding boots in my fast approaching retirement. We currently own two riding horses and three broodmares who are in foal and would like to provide full retirement grass livery for up to four horses and full, full stable livery for up to four horses. Hence the application for an American barn housing eight stables with necessary storage space and a forage barn. I have also obtained an agricultural holding number so that I can keep sheep which will assist in keeping the ground in good condition. I have plans to plant three areas of cops in corners of the land and a small fruit and flower orchard in the front field adjoining Tatmore Road. Uh, and my daughter-in-law has told me she's going to provide the bees for it. In hindsight, I've been a little hasty in my course of actions as I didn't appreciate the process or potential timescale of planning application. I assumed that- You have one minute to go, one minute to go. Thank you. I assumed that by applying for planning in June, I would have a building up in place for the winter, but which is always a difficult time of year with horses and animals. As winter has approached um, and planning wasn't forthcoming, but the ground was still relatively dry, I felt it prudent to put in a little bit of infrastructure. So have already installed a bit of track as per my application and a mobile shelter on skids. So we have somewhere dry and out of the mud for the horses to go. Since my little horse lorry, which I think you saw in the photo, has been stuck in the mud for over two weeks now, I'm grateful to have the track for my car, although I'm sorry it was installed in advance of the final decision. Um, being a very small village, Moorlinch doesn't have a parish council, but parish meeting, which I am aware delivered an objection to my application based on submissions from two anonymous parties. However, on the outside, we have been made very welcome in the village and have four letters of support from named local residents. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to talk time on you, but thank, thank you very much. Thank you. No problem. Members, any comments or questions, please? Mm -hmm. 
Yes, Councillor Kingham and then Councillor Pearce. Yeah, right, thank you, Chairman. Um, this particular site, I mean, so the, the photographs probably don't give it any justice, but it is quite a, a sloping site and quite a runoff from of water down to the road. And there are a number of properties which are suffering from the runoff because obviously work, some work has started on site. And of course, that means that you've got a lot of muddy water running down over the hill out into the road. I don't know on the conditions, it does say that um, no stormwater is to go onto the highways, but there are a number of properties which were still prone to being flooded by a runoff from the new site. So I'm not sure whether the fact that they've actually started, whether it's an expected or a new application. But uh, we'll leave it at the moment. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, so the application was submitted um, in advance of any works being carried out. But um, as you can see from the site photos, the access track work has started on delivering the access into there. Um, certainly, um, as you could see from, it was quite sunny actually, so you might not be able to see particularly clearly, but they have started partitioning off some of the field um, and there are horses on the site. Um, this is the, uh, the road as it is at the moment. Obviously at the moment, this part does need to still be consolidated. There is a condition that would require that first five metres to be consolidated and a condition that would require um, uh, to, to prevent surface water draining onto the highway. Um, it is in flood zone one. Um, in terms of uh, changing to the land generally, obviously it will be a mixed use of agriculture and equestrian, relatively quite small amounts of, of built form uh, limited to these two buildings here and a permeable surface for the arena formed of, with the sand and rubber base. So in terms of increases, you're looking at the five metres here um, and then these these two buildings. Yeah. So obviously, as works have started, the initial con there are pre commencement conditions. It would be suggested that we look at those as being carried out within three months of commencement of the decision date, as opposed to pre commencement as they have already started some works. Run off. Obviously, the road will be. Um have a drain in it, but where the water runs to adjoining properties, will there be provisions put in for that? Yep, bear with me one moment, sorry. So condition nine of the report at the moment um, relates to surface water drainage. Um, so we can amend that to include some further details. Councillor Kingham. Councillor King, I'm just going to say, so in effect, what we're looking at is, an, as I understand, an amendment to condition nine, so that it would cover not only water that's discharging onto the highway, but water that is discharging from the site, that a plan would be drawn as to how that's going to be dealt with. Okay. Councillor Pierce. Yep, that's okay. Um, yeah, my, my initial concerns was the, the, the narrowness of the road um, that it opens out onto, but highways have no concerns and there are plans to create a visibility display. And um, with reassurances over the um, water um, control and management, I mean, it, it, it doesn't seem like an overdevelopment of the site in terms of the business and it seems sustainable. And on the basis with those um, reassurances that you've just discussed, I'm happy to propose the uh, the application. Thank you very much. Is that seconded? Thank you, Councillor Scott. And yeah, just to confirm that's that's with the amended conditions relating to discharge of surface water and commencement. Yeah, so the commencement will be within three months of the, of the permission being issued. And I guess any detailed wording to be agreed with Chairman and Vice Chairman as, as normal. So 
If there's no further comments, I'm not seeing any from members. We have the recommendation to grant permission subject to those amended conditions. All those in support, please show. It was seconded by Councillor Scott. And that would have, is that unanimous? Councillor Murphy, is your hand up? I can't. Were you, I did, we were just checking whether you were voting because we hadn't seen your hand. Oh, that's fine. Okay, we missed you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. That, in which case, that is unanimous. That is clearly carried. So permission is granted subject to those amended conditions. Right, members, if you turn to the next application that we have for this afternoon, and that is on page 80 and within the parish of Wedmore. Canberra, and I think Mr. Titchener, you're going to be presenting this one. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Members. Um, so the application is for the change of use of a uh, public house, uh, sweet generous use to a residential dwelling. It's at the Pambra Inn, um, Wells Road in Pambra. Thank you. So um, just by way of background, and many members will be familiar with the background on this because it's not the first time it's been to committee. Um, so there was there was a previous application to go way back, which was submitted in 2019, and that was subsequently withdrawn in 2019 um, on the um, basis that at the time we could not, as officers, um, and with the advice we've received from the Valor and Economic Development Team support the proposal, they then submitted uh, another application, uh, which is the current application in July 2020. Uh, uh, that came to committee in November 2020 and was the change of use was approved by committee following our recommendations as officers to approve it. Um, that decision was then subject to a successful judicial review in the courts. So the decision that was taken by the council was effectively quashed. Uh, so what happens in those circumstances, the application comes back to us. It's just the decision that gets quashed. The application stays with us, but it's back to us for redetermination. So hence, it's now um, been back through the process and is back with members with a recommendation again. Um, so what has happened since uh, the time of the uh, judicial review decision is the applicant, and I'll go into the reasons why, but the applicant has undertaken public consultation exercise in the summer of this year. Um, and there have been a couple other changes in circumstances. So um, the the building, the actual, what was the, the effectively the Pamber Inn has actually been sold. The applicant is no longer the owner. They were the owner at the time of, it was previously determined. A uh, couple purchased it um, after the decision uh, was uh, taken by uh, Sedgemore. And they have commenced some works to change its use to a single family dwelling now. Um, and also, just by way of an update, uh, since the committee report was published, um, uh, we have been provided with a letter um, which uh, sent to the council. It was also sent to the parish council um, uh, some time previously uh, from 11 uh, households that live in close proximity to the public house. So they live in Pambra. Uh, they are some of the um, uh, properties uh, closest to the um, to the to the pub um, and um, it's quite a long letter I'll just try and cover off of what it says just so members are aware um, so um, it acknowledges that at the time there was considerable local opposition to the proposal when it was originally put forward uh, and including the opposition from many of those who signed this most recent letter that's just come in um, however in their view and they don't speak for all the objectors however uh, they now consider it's time to move on uh, they consider the investment to make the pub work is too much uh, they do not wish for a protracted planning dispute or appeals which leave a semi-derelict pub on the edge of the village. 
They also note that new owners have purchased the premises who've expended money to transform the property into a single family home. The letter says the owners admit this was an error of judgment as the judicial review came to light only about three to four weeks before they were due to complete on the purchase, um, but went ahead anyway. The letter considers the consequences of different recommendation from the committee today uh, would have catastrophic, catastrophic implications for the new owners. Um, the, uh, it acknowledges the decision must, any decision taken today must be based on planning policy, but they would urge that proportionality and fairness is uh, taken into account. And they'd also invite the councillor to support any other measures that might be available locally to support events, um, such as the Green Man sort of pop up pub, um, which occurs uh, occasionally in Thiel. Uh, I'll just put this map up just to show because this map came in with the um, uh, with the uh, the letter uh, and just the houses with the sort of uh, coloured annotation on them uh, show um, where the uh, respondents uh, or the signers signees of that letter live. So this is the Pamba in here. So we are talking about a number of the properties that live certainly in closest proximity to it. Uh, many people will be familiar where the Pambury Inn is. It's on the road between uh, Wedmore and uh, Wells. Uh, it's got a sort of site uh, just on the sort of eastern edge uh, as the road that swings past. And here's a public car park in the building here. Um, the red line of the application site uh, on the location plan just shows the plot, which includes the building, the car park, and its associated garden. Uh, floor plans um, uh, don't give a great amount of detail, but just show obviously it's quite it's a decent sized property with some skittle alley, etc. Uh, and a reasonable amount of accommodation first floor level. Uh, I've got some photos. These are the ones that were taken at the original site visit when the application first came in. And I've got a more recent one as well to show at the end, just showing the pub uh, here with its um, the, the main building um, part of the skittle alley in its, in its car park. This is the other side, which is viewed from what is a public right of way, which leads down to a couple of properties and then um, countryside uh, beyond. And again, large car park, you can see it's quite a, a, re a reasonable sized property. And again, some of the garden um, uh, associated with it, uh, et cetera. Uh, and again, a picture of the car park. These pictures are taken much more recently, only within the last week um, and it, Give a sense of um, what it looks like currently. They do show some of the works that the current owners uh, have started to undertake, including taking off some of the render and changing some of the windows uh, just in their attempt to modernize it. Um, and you can see on this elevation, which is the one again taken from where the footpath leads, you can see the windows have, have been uh, recently changed. Uh, so just in terms of a bit more on the judicial review. So that judgment was made on 17th June 2021. Um, uh, it considered there to be a flaw uh, regarding the application of policy D35, which is a policy that's applied in regard to local services, provision of new local services, and importantly, in this case, the loss of existing local services. Um, it also considered there to be a failure regarding um, the duties under the Equality Act. Um, uh, so um, in, in relation to policy D35, um, that requires, it's, it's particularly regarding one bullet point in policy D35, um, but how that was applied. It says the policy uh, requires there to be evidence of community consultation and consideration of alternative ways of delivering the service. Um, it, it was not considered there was evidence of such consultation about the permanent loss of the public house and didn't consider that the consultation that had happened on two planning applications that we had received for the proposal was sufficient in order to meet that criterion. Uh, so um, the judge considered that had such a consultation been carried out, it may have given rise to innovative solutions about how the pub potentially could have been retained or in some other retained in some other form. And in regard to the Equality Act, there needs to be evidence that the council had asked itself about implications for protected uh, characteristics. Um, so under the under the public sector equality duty, so those are protected characteristics that are defined in the Act. So they are, um, there's nine of them. So they're age, disability, gender assignment, marriage and civil partnership, pregnancy, maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation. So the report that's before members today and this presentation touches on um, much of it, um, seek to address those issues uh, and any others considered in previous determination.
So the relevant policy framework, as I mentioned, I mentioned policy D35, that's the key one, uh, but also uh, Wedmore Neighbourhood Plan covers this area. They have a policy WED13, uh, which is also about local uh, services facilities. So the things that policy D35 requires is that there's all in terms of to say that the loss of a uh, facility such as this to be supportable, that there must be alternative provision available, that there's no longer demand and that facility is not viable. That the facility is not fit for purpose and that there's evidence of community consultation consideration of alternative ways of delivering the service. Now, the first three bullet points of that policy were not were not queried in the judgment. They felt that that had been adequately um, adequately addressed. It was that final bullet point there. Um, and then regards to WED 13, uh, in, uh, in terms of that's requirements, that there should be no prospect of viable use and therefore need demonstrated for a change. And effectively, that's a very similar assessment to what was undertaken in the first three bullet points of D35. And there's no adverse impact on the natural and built environment. Um, um, and also on that regard, the judgment uh, was not critical in terms of how those bullet points have been applied. So, um, as, a, as I said, yeah, the Wedmore Neighbourhood Plan Policy, it protects those locally valued services. So the, the loss should only be allowed where there's no reasonable prospect of viable continued use. Um, so the thrust is similar, therefore, across the two policies. They have slightly different wording. Um, um, uh, but so the loss uh, essentially should be resisted unless it can be demonstrated there's no alternative provision available and no demand for appropriate marketing um, and that there's been that community consultation exercise. So in terms of the, the assessment, so um, as I mentioned, in terms of the first thing we had to do previously, and I do have to go over it again, um, although I appreciate members will have discussed this at the previous one, it was just about the marketing that had been undertaken. The first application was withdrawn. Um, because, and that's going back to 2019, because there hadn't been sufficient um, uh, sufficient marketing in our view. So they went then and under, undertook a marketing exercise. Um, so, um, uh, and that was undertaken by two agents. So Sydney Phillips, they're more specialized licensed premises um, uh, um, uh, agency, uh, and also by Greenslade Taylor Hunt. So there are, um, many people will be familiar with them, they're much more local. Um, uh, organization, the state agency, um, uh, both put it on the market in 2019 with a guide price of 485,000. So it was marketed via expected means. So that was what we, you know, various websites, um, various trade websites, um, uh, right move, et cetera, the boards place outside. So, um, but it didn't generate particularly amount, uh, a great amount of interest. Uh, Sydney Phillips, there's only one viewing in person. They were interested, but withdrew as um, the bank would not support their proposal. Greenslade Taylor Hunt, their marketing generated six viewings, none led to further interest. Um, people consider it. Some of the reasons cited were that it's too big, uh, too much work required, uncertain viability, or that it was considered to be a difficult location. So um, the, the price. Uh, that it was marketed for at the time um, was uh, 485,000, which was considered, which was notably higher than the applicant at that time, uh, who was uh, the then owner, had paid. They paid 330,000 in 2016. Um, so um, some clarification was requested of the agents regarding the price um, and, and why it was pitched at that level. Uh, so Sydney Phillips recommended the price on the basis of the market evidence available at the time, said other pubs had been selling at similar prices. Um, they felt that prices in the earlier, in the, in the couple of years leading up to that point, had been suppressed by a number of large chain dis disposals, uh, which was artificially keeping it lower. Greenslade Table Hunt said there were some more positive market signals um, uh, at the time. Um, and it was in line with other similar disposals um, and they felt there was some flexibility for multi-use business because it considered it could have been a popular location um, uh, uh, and also our, we asked them for their views on the likelihood that it might reopen as a public house. Um, Sydney Phillips uh, felt that the industry was entering another turbulent time. Uh, Covid uh, was um, uh, on, uh, has started at the point that these comments were made and they felt that restrictions uh, were going to be a threat to viability. Um, uh, and you know, we are now over a year on and they obviously continue to be so for, for many such premises. 
Greenslade were um, not particularly positive. They didn't really feel there was a likelihood it was going to be open, F certainly felt not in the current condition and uh, particularly with the whole trade struggling. Uh, we also sought some independent advice internally. Um, so uh, from um, the Council's economic development team and from, our, uh, from the valuer, um, the uh, economic development team commented in detail on the scheme they noted the applicant's statements about business viability um, um, uh, and initially felt this was not backed up by marketing to evidence it. Um, uh, so hence why originally they were asked to go out and put it on, on the market so we could, so we could, so that could be tested. They noted the proximity of the site to good country, to beautiful countryside, a number of wildlife reserves and said potentially it could be quite well placed. Um, they noted the, the proximity of a pub such as the Sheppey, many people will be familiar with. It's not very far away. It's probably the closest pub to this one. It's a um, very successful public house uh, in Godney, um, but that was also on the market at the same time. Uh, so, um, and they consider that to be a much more appealing proposition. Uh, and they noted at the time the outlook of the pubs had changed dramatically since the last application. Uh, they felt that pre-COVID pubs are closing at alarming rate anyway and viability was now highly uncertain. Um, economic development stated ideally they'd liked it to be marketed for longer, um, but didn't consider it a re realistic uh, possibility and that an empty pub was not a good advert for any area. Uh, the value was, was similar in their views. Initially they felt the pub should be marketed for longer, but felt in the current climate and the devastation of the industry that, that there was little point in uh, marketing it uh, any longer. So ultimately uh, they did not consider the price to be a, unreasonable, felt there was little point in uh, uh, prolonging uh, any kind of marketing period. Uh, so um, they did not request any further marketing was undertaken and felt that that exercise at the time had gone far enough. Um, so we felt at the time, and still do, that that, that advice was sufficient to demonstrate it was, that it was, the facility was not viable to operate as a public house, and it reasonably follows from that that the facility is not fit for purpose, and the need for the change of use had been demonstrated. There is also alternative provision available nearby. We've mentioned the Sheppey, um, but there's pubs in Wells and um, uh, Wedmore, uh, which are uh, not far distant. In terms of the the requirement of D35 about community consultation. This is obviously the main consideration um, uh, that is new uh, from the previous consideration. So the applicant following the judiciary route was, was advised that that exercise needed to be undertaken. So they went and did a survey. Uh, they put together a survey which was made available online, uh, which sought to gain views about the change of use to single dwelling and the loss of the public house. Uh, it asked questions about the use of the facility, uh, use of other facilities locally, people's preference for the building's future use. It asked about alternative ways of delivering a service. Um, it was made available for six weeks in July and August uh, of uh, 2021 and received a total of 119 responses, uh, majority of which were very local. And when I say very local, I mean within Pambrough Field and the, and the, and the villages surrounding uh, and onto, onto Wedmore. So there's a bit of a split in terms of views, um, about 55 percented 55% uh, that responded to that accepted the change of use and felt it should go ahead. 35% wanted a return to a, to a public house and felt it should reopen. Fewer than 5% expressed an interest in being personally or financially involved in running this or any other public house or a similar type venue. Um, some alternative suggestions were made in terms of what, what could be done differently. You know, uh, would these amount to innovative solutions? Um, uh, these were, uh, and this, I mean, some people said just keep it as a pub. Um, some said split the freehold, maybe put the pub in the Skittle Alley. Uh, excuse the typo there uh, at the end of uh, that point number two. Um, uh, someone said get draft beer. Someone said maybe set up a campsite as a way to diversify. The views of the applicant, I mean, they, they, they provided their considerations on those uh, and they felt that in regard to point one, that the evidence indicated that such use was not, was not viable. Regarding number two, um, they consider there to be some difficulties there regarding planning and licensing potentially uh, would need to be subject to that. Uh, and they also highlighted the declining support of premises and the investment needed uh, to sustain such a venue. Um, regarding the draft beer thing, I mean, that's really a management issue, to be honest, but they just, but again, there needs to be sufficient turnover. You, you know, if you're having draft beer, obviously you need to really sell through it. And one of the things that certainly has been an issue with the uh, site is the lack of um, uh, 
the lack of walk, uh, walk-in sort of uh, footfall needed to sustain that and whether and even that as the economic development team had uh, acknowledged what this place uh, requires is significant investment um, uh, whether that would be enough uh, the campsite thing or m maybe that might enable them to diversify a little bit um, it would be subject to potentially uh, planning commission um, there is some other provision nearby and whether that would be enough um, but those are the suggestions that we put forward um, so there was some concern expressed locally about the method and the reach of the consultation exercise um, you know some question the absence of local leafleting uh, and reliance on the online questionnaire, but response numbers we consider to be quite high for a rural proposal. Um, 119, you know, there's not that many houses in Pambra in, in, when you when you saw the map, if you look at before. Um, so it certainly seems to have cut through. Uh, it was also um, picked up on a number of local online forums. There was also an open meeting which was held in Field Village Hall to discuss the future of the pub. Um, so that wasn't organised by the applicant, um, it was organised by a concerned villager. Um, it was attended by the new owners of the public house who had bought the premises. It was also attended by the person who instigated the judicial review. Uh, it was chaired by one of the parish councillors uh, in their personal capacity. Uh, the survey was discussed at the meeting and there was clearly a level of awareness about uh, the consultation. Um, so. Um, so in terms of alternative ways of delivering the service, um, um, well, just, just to recap on the consultation. So yes, there were concerns, um, but in our view, I think we were saying that actually it seems to cut through enough. I don't think we would be concerned about uh, that people weren't aware. I think there certainly needs to be a, uh, a level of awareness about it. So, um, uh, and that there's been sufficient opportunity for people to be able to um, uh, to make their views put forward. So finally, on to um, uh, the remaining parts of the relevant policies. So Web 13, the Web or Neighbourhood Plan policy said there should be no adverse impact on the natural built environment. Um, the county ecologists have raised no concerns about impact on protected species. Uh, no external works were, were proposed as part of the application. Uh, um, uh, so, and uh, what we have proposed to do, and this was picked up in the judgment, was it said it would be an option for us to do uh, is to remove permitted development rights to control future extensions. It is quite a large building, so there is a potential for future extensions to be relatively generous. So a more belt and braces approach perhaps uh, is proposed on this one uh, just to exert some control over changes to the built environment. But with those controls, we consider WED 13 to be met. Um, and just, I do have to touch on the public sector quality duty because it did form part of the judgment. So public authorities have a due regard uh, to uh, objectives of the Equality Act. The Act defines protected characteristics and the need to advance the quality of opportunity. The proposal is obviously for the loss of the public health. Um, um, so, and such facilities will meet the day-to-day -day needs of the local community. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, the use of such of public houses tends to be, uh, in our view, typically community-wide rather than relating to one specific protected group. Um, the public house is closed and, that, and has been for some time, such that members of the community, whether or not they would belong to one of those protected groups I identified earlier, would not have been able to make use of the facility and would not have been able to for some time. It is also a private operation, the public house, so the council has no powers to force it to open, to offer any such facility to anyone. It could remain closed whether regardless of the decision uh, taken today. Uh, the judgment also noted that none of the objections to the grant plan permission suggested that uh, there would be any adverse, adverse impact on any protected characteristics. Um, so there were some comments in the consultation about protected characteristics because questions were asked, particularly about that point. Um, uh, and some people provided comments, not many, but some said, you know, it's a facility and it it would be a value to, to some people in the community. So it could be used as a as a place for a young family to visit, as a, as I said, as a venue where one feels comfortable and safe. As I said, as a place for older and more vulnerable people to, to, to live alone, to be isolational, or for those who feel discriminated against due to their sexual orientation, religion, or ethnicity, um, uh, in, were some of the comments that came in. Um, now, they undoubtedly, there are obvious benefits for the community from facilities such as pubs. You know, they do provide places for people to meet and socialise. 
Um, but it's not considered that any one protected characteristic is specifically impacted by any decision to grant the change of use. Um, and we would also say that it should be borne in mind that there remain alternative public health facilities within the local area that could meet these needs identified by respondents in their comments. And on that basis, and having considered those comments, and uh, it's considered the duty to have due regard to those objectives has been met. Uh, and just to wrap up, just other matters. There's adjoining public right of way. Uh, the county council hasn't objected, and uh, um, we would impose our standard informative uh, regarding impact on the right of way uh, if permission is granted. The highway authority uh, gave standing advice uh, regarding the use of the access. I mean, it's an existing access as a large parking area. Um, uh, so potentially there would be the use as a public house would have a higher uh, and more intensive uh, level of activity uh, than a dwelling. So in planning terms and in highway terms, it's it's likely to be, result in a reduction and therefore is acceptable. The drainage board gave standing advice, but as no external works proposed, that there'll be no the proposal will not increase flood risk. Um, so just on the final slide, and I appreciate it's been quite a long presentation on something that members of had in front of them before but it is regrettable obviously and it's still regrettable but we do feel still that proposal complies with the relevant tests in d35 and web 13 and therefore our recommendation is again to grant planning permission thank you uh, members any comments or questions i think i've got councillor hendry up first have you got the microphone right <laughs> Okay. How long have you got, Brian? <laughs> Thank you to team for the presentation. Very good, very full. Okay. Um, the current owners have stated that it'd be catastrophic if this was not allowed today. We'll just touch on that first to show you how catastrophic it would be. Because it's listed as a pub in Pan Britain, they'd be liable to pay commercial rates commercial insurance. They'd be responsible for the hygiene standards in the kitchen to be inspected, the public liability insurance, health and safety. That's even before they get off the ground. The pub's not, for, not fit for purpose anymore, and, and that's plain to see. It's been for sale for two or three years, nothing at all. The pub side, if it's gone down so far, they've got no customers, no clientele, and it's not fit for purpose, as we just said. The consultation was a big point uh, last year when it went to court over this. They allegedly hadn't consulted the, the local people about it or what their thoughts were. Fortunately, that seems to have happened now. Uh, as a case officer pointed out, there's, there's more people in favour of it now in the village than there is against. One year ago, it was the exact opposite, but now the people have come round to accept that it's not going to be a pub again. That's, that's not going to happen. Uh, there was a few, a few minor points uh, with the, um, the policies last year, but I think that was on to back up the fact about the consultation, but that was nothing major to stop anything. Uh, all in all, just to wrap this up and just to so I can I can close my part of the conversation because I know Brian will be pleased. I would like at this point, before it goes any further, to bring forward the case officer's recommendation to grant permission, and I stand by that and I voted for it last year as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Grimes, you indicated. working. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Well, after a very thorough explanation, I'm happy to second the recommendation. Thank you. Any further comments or questions that any members have? Councillor Kingham. Ready. It's rather a sad day that we lose yet another public house on that road. Between Wedmore and Wells, there used to be six. One. So, I don't know how long that will last, but uh, it's a sign of the time, I'm afraid. And uh, all my hard work will hopefully remain. Thank you. Seeing any other comments or questions that members have. So in which case, we've had a recommendation that's been moved and seconded to, to grant permission. All those in favour, please show. That's unanimous, so that's clearly carried. Uh, permission is, is granted. Right, members, that brings us as far as I'm aware to the end of our business for today. Mr Nipper, there's nothing else that you want? Mr Dewey, no. In which case, thank you all very much for your uh, contributions today and we'll close the meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>